Let me begin by saying I'm aware that there has been a rumour that there will be a motion on the agenda tonight in relation to the situation in Gaza. Although we do have two public speakers who I understand wish to speak about the conflict, uh, I confirm there is no related motion this evening. Um, as usual, our meetings are being webcast so that residents and other members of the public have the opportunity to see them either live or to view them on demand later. In the unlikely event of any kind of emergency requiring, re requiring an evacuation, uh, please make yourself aware of the emergency exits and follow the instructions of the security staff present this evening. But I remind everyone, as usual, to behave respectfully and appropriately at tonight's meeting in order that we have a good, productive debate and giving as many members as possible the opportunity to have their say and make their contribution. I'll also remind members that the guillotine will fall three hours and 30 minutes after the start of this meeting, and I intend to have one break during the meeting at an appropriate point for approximately 15 minutes. So we come to apologies. I've received apologies from councillors Hollier, uh, Wardby and Pearson. Are there any other apologies? I don't see any, of, any others, thank you. I remind all those present members, officers and members of the public, please turn off mobile phones that are likely to be disturbing. Uh, or at least turn to silent, mute other electronic equipment during the course of the meeting. And with regard to the conduct of the meeting, before we move on to the business, again, I remind everyone of our agreement at the July meeting of full council, when we passed a motion requiring the Lord Mayor to remind all of us of our net zero targets. And so with that in mind, You'll be aware that York's target for the uh, 2030 net zero, to achieve that, we need to adapt and thrive despite extreme weather. We need to encourage new skills. We need to ensure a just, a just transition. And so we thanks to our partners and officers working together. We're proud the city has recently achieved global recognition for climate action with the A rating from the Carbon Disclosure Project. But we recognize this is just a start. With only 2,232 days between now and the 31st of December, 2029, the challenge of the climate emergency remains. As usual, I invite you to speak clearly during the debate. Please use your microphone. Remember to switch off the microphone and uh, indicate when you're wishing to speak by raising a hand. I'll then call on you to speak at the appropriate time and whilst time permits. So let's keep the meeting focused to the point and I'll do my best to keep us on track. Item number one, declaration of interest. I ask all members who have a personal, prejudicial, or disclosable pecuniary interest in any of the business to be discussed at tonight's meeting to declare that interest now, if you've not already done so, on the register of interests beforehand. I don't see any declarations. Thank you. Item two, the approval of minutes. Do I have members approval to sign minutes of the ordinary council meeting held here on the 21st of September, 2023? That makes things easier. Item three, civic announcements. Uh, I have no um, civic announcements except to just follow up on um, uh, something I mentioned last time when I look forward to uh, the potential visit of the German ambassador, and I'm delighted that he is coming to York next week. 
Item four, public participation. Uh, six registered speakers tonight. Before we proceed with our speakers, uh, I remind each of them of the rules relating to public participation. Uh, following our council constitution, uh, procedural rules in exercising uh, public participation rights, a member of the public is entitled to express views, positive or negative, about the performance of the council, but not to say anything which is defamatory or discriminatory, not to make any personal attack on an officer or to disclose confidential or exempt information, including personal information. That being said, I call on our first speaker, John Pybus, who'd like to speak on the petition at agenda item five relating to the pedestrianization of Fosgate. Mr. Pybus, you have three minutes to address the council. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you can hear me. Um, I wrote a book called The History of the Blue Bell, 1798 to 2022, and it is available for 1295 from all good pubs. Um, whilst I was doing the research for the book, I found council documents from 1985, which is when I was born. And these council documents were traders, independent traders on Fosgate, trying to get the street pedestrianised. So this goes right the way back to the year of my birth. Um, so we've tried successively to try and get Fosgate pedestrianised, and it just hasn't worked. It's fallen on deaf ears. So what we did recently was we lodged a petition, and as of today, it's got 1,700 signatures, and this is going to be presented to council today. Um, and it makes sense. This is what I just want to say to you today. It makes sense to pedestrianise Fosgate. First of all, Piccadilly runs parallel, so there's not really any big transport problems getting around the city. Number one, however, is pollution and air quality. We know from living in York, we're in a massive valley here, air quality is terrible. Taking more traffic off the streets of a city centre is common sense and it's good for everybody. Number two, disability access. Unfortunately, over the last sort of 24 months, we obviously had the uh, Coronavirus Regulations Act, which gave us the uh, possibility of having pavement licenses outside. But what this did cause was a lot of disabled issues with access up and down the street and into businesses. Unfortunately, with the press and the sort of polarisation of society, it came across an awful lot, but it was disability groups versus hospitality businesses. What we want to do with pedestrianisation is completely take that argument off the table. We think that by pedestrianising the street, we can have better air quality, we can have disabled access, and number three, we can have a thriving cafe culture on Fosgate. Going up and down Fosgate over the last two years in the summer with the coronavirus regulations letting us trade outside, it was a really lovely experience. And the more that us businesses make uh, in profit, the more business rates we pay, the more that we can actually put back into our local communities. And lastly, we do know it's complex. We, we know that there's no magic wand that you can really uh, wave here. There's deliveries concerns, there's residents that live on Fosgate with cars, and there's different types of businesses as well. So we do expect a full consultation to take place. However, where there is a will, there is a way. Um, I want to say a big thank you to councillors Clark, Merritt and Melly. You've been really wonderful. All your hard work and all your time so far has been massively appreciated by all of us independent traders. And I just call on full council to finally do the right thing. I'm 38, 30 uh, so I don't want it to take too much longer. It has been going on my entire life. Um, but yeah, please do the right thing and finally pedestrianise Fosgate. Thank you. Thank you. Your comments have been noted. Thank you. Uh, I call on our second speaker, Stephanie Brody. I understand she'd like to speak to agenda item eight, specifically the motion relating to supporting York's neurodivergent adults. Thank you. Hello. I'd like you to imagine waking up one morning feeling numb, crying as you've no hope, no future, feeling unheard, misunderstanding and no future, sitting at the top of your stairs, wanting to throw yourself down and break your neck. Imagine you have been asking for help since 2020. Over the last three years, you've experienced severe major life traumas, incidences, and more or less one after another. Neurotypical person would struggle to manage, never mind someone with late diagnosis of autism and ADHD and other neurodiversities, struggling and unable to regulate control and characteristics of neurodiversity, which means loss of skills, um, chronic exhaustion, difficulty communicating, and much more. One of these is emotional dysregulation, which obviously under a mental health is labelled as well, but it's different. The reason it's different is that dysregulation um, from autism and ADHD people 
it's to do with their executive functioning. So how you treat executive functioning disabilities to mental health are totally separate. Obviously, I try GPs, other services, um, the Duke, Huntington House, all of which closed their doors to me. Unfortunately, on the 11th of October, out of the blue, when I woke that morning, I decided to commit suicide. I wasn't successful, thankfully, and it was because um, an ambulance came and I was in there for 10 hours at York Hospital. I remember vaguely leaving, staggering out, getting no further help. They said I discharged myself, but my neighbour across the road says I was in such a state I couldn't stand. I was staggering everywhere. I got home and unfortunately my partner at the time left me. Probably says a bit more about him than me. Um, autism people are more likely to think about suicide and want to do that. Um, 35% are planned and up to 66% have a thought of doing so. Why suicide? Because especially those that are high functioning, we camouflage and mask more, we're trying to hide it. As you can see, I'm fiddling with something here. I'm trying not to swear because that's not acceptable. And unfortunately it's one of my ticks that has happened when I'm under due, lots of stress. Training, I believe is the most important thing with yourselves and those in the hospitals and the doctors. They say they do the training, but they don't. I've often been told by a GP that I can control what I am, I can control my stammers, and I can look at them. That's not always the case. As you've noticed, I've not got good eye contact, so I am trying to look away because I feel very uncomfortable. 30 seconds. One of the questions I'd like you to ask yourself is why has the neurodiverse community been overlooked? Why has the autism strategy been placed with learning disabilities and why is it not active and live? I was actually part of the original group in 2019 and nothing's ever happened. When you look at places like Cambridge and Peterborough, it's thriving. It's absolutely amazing what they're doing. Training at different levels, depending on staff and front of house staff is, is imperative and it's required under the health um, care act. Thank you. So it's important that right support, right care and right culture um, we start to deliver. Why have I met, not met one, um, when you've met one Europe first person, you've you met to... one Europe first person, can't get the words out. I know. When I you've know. met, please draw to when you have there. met one neurodiverse person, you have met one neurodiverse person. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry to cut you off there, but we have to be fair in three minutes. Okay. Okay, I appreciate it. Okay. Our third speaker, Hazel Carrison, would also like to speak on agenda item eight, again, specifically the motion relating to supporting York's neurodivergent adults. Two minutes. I'm here wearing many hats today, not only as a representative of the York Disability Rights Forum and as a neurodivergent individual, but also as a voluntary peer support worker who predominantly works with people who experience suicidal ideation, self-harm and voice hearing. Through all three of these areas of my life, I've spoken to and worked with multiple people who have been affected by the recent autism and ADHD pilot pathway. Several of those who have been pushed into crisis in no, in no small part due to the stress, confusion, invalidation that the pilot has caused. Many of these people are too vulnerable to come and speak to you all in front of themselves, but I have permission to speak on their behalf. And I, I don't really have time to go into it at length today, but I would welcome and invite anyone with interest in the topic to discuss some of the concerns and fears that I hear on a weekly basis. I've spoken at the last three health and wellbeing board meetings on some of these topics. I also see these issues reflected in the Health Watch report on the autism and ADHD pathway and the statements that we at RD, um, YDRF have collected. I would like to invite everyone here to read both the Health Watch report and these statements that we've published on our website. These harms are real and happening. They're not just hypothetical numbers on a spreadsheet. On a personal note, I've got schizoaffective disorder, as well as being diagnosed with both autism and ADHD. I have a long history of eating disorders, self-harm, suicide attempts, as well as substance misuse in the form of self-medicating. I've been in and out of the mental health system for over 17 years, and until my autism and ADHD were identified, I was regularly misdiagnosed, mistreated, blamed, and gaslit due to the lack of understanding of my non-neurotypical brain and the ways in which I not only present, but also process the world. It's well documented that the mental health service is, not, is often not the best environment for autistic and ADHD people. It wasn't designed for us after all. Living as a neurodivergent person can be extremely difficult. In many ways, we are forced to live in a world that is not designed for our needs. 
were often not understood by those around us. There are stereotypes and stigmas and myths galore. People make assumptions about us. We're often gaslit and finding support can be nigh on impossible. Without a diagnosis, we are doubted by those around us and are, le and are left without adjustments, DSA, benefits, etc. Not to mention that with diagnosis comes with self-understanding and community. I've heard a lot about moving towards a social model, and although that's great, we do still need diagnosis and assessment for many. Being neurodivergent is an integ integral part of my existence. It's not something I can turn down or put down when it's not convenient. 30 seconds. Our community has been damaged greatly this year, made to feel like collateral damage and to feel like, feel like our opinions and expertise and our, own ex and our experience doesn't matter. Many of us are here and we're willing to have conversations about this. Use our experience. We deserve to be involved in decisions that affect us. Thank you. Thank you. Your comments are noted and will be taken into account when we reach that item. Our fourth speaker, Dr. Richard Murgatroyd, would like to speak on the statement made by the council on 10th of October in light of the escalating crisis in Gaza. Uh, Dr. Murgatroyd. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, I've only got three minutes, so I'm going to speak to the point. Yesterday, we sent every councillor here an emergency motion on the genocide that's unfolding in Gaza. Uh, we've been informed that the council's procedure does not allow for that motion to be heard. And as the Lord Mayor said, it's not on the agenda. Um, however, we do know that um, item 15 on the agenda allows the chair discretion to introduce any other business considered urgent. And Lord Mayor, think there can be no more urgent business than the question of Palestine-Israel. It's wholly relevant to the work of this council. Firstly, the motion we sent reminded you uh, of the statement made of the, on the 10th of October by the leaders of the political groups represented here. Now, that statement rightly condemned violence against civilians. It urged restraint and that international law be upheld. But, Lord Mayor, that honourable and reasonable appeal has been overtaken by events. The catastrophe has unfolded before our eyes, on our screens, and unless urgent action is taken, it will only get worse. It is therefore pressing that the council urgently updates its position here tonight. Secondly, Lord Mayor, there is a pressing moral emergency that directly challenges York's claim to be a human rights city and city of sanctuary. Please be in no doubt by the words and deeds of the extremist Netanyahu government, it's shown that their aim is nothing less than to ethnically cleanse Gaza of the native Palestinian people. 2.3 million of them. And that can only be achieved by levelling Gaza to the ground, by destroying its infrastructure, its housing, and removing access to the very things that sustain human life. And that is why our proposed motion sent to every councillor here did not hesitate to use the word genocide to describe those actions. It's a terrible word. It's a terrible deed, but it's the only accurate one that can be applied. So, Lord Mayor, I would uh, urge you to say if York City Council is to deserve to retain the status of a human rights city, it's got to turn warm words into deeds. About 20 that, seconds. That brings me finally, Lord Mayor, to the third reason. We need action. We need to call for a permanent ceasefire and encourage a genuine peace dialogue in the region. But peace will only come when justice is served for the people of Palestine. That means an end to illegal settlements an end to ethnic cleansing, an end to apartheid policies. And we today, this council today, Lord Mayor, can actually make that statement, let's treat this as urgent business. Well, I think we have a further speaker Professor Mohammed El Gomatai, who will also speak on the escalating crisis in Gaza. Again, three minutes. Lord Mayor, 
councillors. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Um, we often hear that uh, Gaza is the most populated place on earth. And it makes me wonder. Some people also call it, and I have made a mistake by calling it um, an open air prison. No, it isn't. It is a concentration camp because an open air prison means that people have committed a crime. And the only crime that the Palestinians people have committed is being Palestinians. We often hear the word Beit Lahia, refugee camp, Jabalia, refugee camp, where the Al Ahli hospital is at the moment and the Shifa hospital are being bombarded. And it, it makes me wonder why should the Palestinians live in a, in a refugee camp in their own cities and district? And then I remember that they are the children and grandchildren of those people who have been ethnically cleansed today to be on the same route from northern Gaza, from these refugee camps, in front of all our eyes. And it makes me feel sad. I hear the politicians in Israel referring to the Gaza, the, the president saying there is no innocent in Gaza. His heritage um, uh, minister says, let's bomb them with a nuclear bomb. And the IDF person says, they are human animals. No, sir, they are our fellow human beings. And we stand by them. I'm not going to... One of the councillors here, and I feel uh, for his pain, and, and, and I'm not going to take too much of it, but here it is, little things like this. You know what is this? We call it the ghost. The French call it the gaze. And it comes from the word, the Arabic word, Gaza. Yes, the Gazan people have developed this gaze, this gaze to heal our world. The people of Gaza today are calling on us to heal their wounds, to bury their dead. And it is a very simple act. And as my colleague here said, appealing to the Lord Mayor, that is it is in our hands to have this motion debated tonight and for New York City to be again on the right side of history. And it's a simple debt that we can repay our fellow human beings in Gaza today, tonight, and there is nothing more than calling for a ceasefire on the goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> We're just going to take this opportunity to say again, the City of York Council deplores violence of all kinds. I refer members and I refer the public to the statement that was made indeed on the 10th of October. We stand by that. And our thoughts are with all those affected by the situation in Gaza. Our hearts go out and we weep as we see the scenes and events unfolding. This concludes the public participation session this evening, and we move on with our agenda as we come to petitions, and we have a total of five petitions to be presented this evening. Uh, procedure rules allow one minute to present each of these petitions to council, and I invite Councillor Waller to present the first of what will be four petitions in relation to the use of Chapelfield's estate improvement funds. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and rather than bobbing up and down, I'll take all four. So, so I'd like to present four petitions. We'll wait just, just for a moment, Councillor Bala. Thank 
Councillor Waller, would, would you like to continue? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I'd like to present four petitions on behalf of residents in Westfield Ward. Firstly, from the residents of Bramow Avenue and nearby roads for heap funds to be allocated. The petition reads, we, the undersigned, call upon City of York Council to use the Chapel Fields estate improvement funds for more dropped curbs on gritting and bus routes in the estate and to develop an estate improvement plan. The second, from a section of Ascombe Lane opposite the junction with Cornmans Road, the wording being, we, the undersigned, called upon City of York Council to use the Westfield Ward funding allocation to improve parking in the area around the flats on Ascombe Lane. The third petition uh, from the residents of Dijon Avenue, Lowfields Drive and Kerr Crescent, in the light of construction traffic at Lowfield Green. The wording being, we call upon the council to, one, use the ward funding allocated to improve parking and access in the area. Two, to make good of the damage that's been done to Dijon Avenue and to resurface Lowfields Drive. Three, deliver the promised report and the timetable to get this work done and to clarify what will happen to the remaining empty plots on Lowfield Green. The fourth petition is another heap petition in light of ongoing issues for parking at the Lincoln Court area around uh, Ascot Way and the problems the number 24 bus faces. And it's uh, worded, we the undersigned call upon City of York Council to use the Westfield Ward funding allocation to improve parking in the Ascot Way area. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. I'm sure it's louder at the back than it is here. Councillor Well, you've presented all four of the uh, petitions, so I invite uh, Councillor Clark to present the Final petition in relation to uh, pedestrianising Fosgate. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, tonight I hand over a petition uh, that calls on City of York Council to do the right thing and pedestrianise Fosgate for the good of everyone. Thank you to John, who spoke earlier, and for participation, and all the business operators and residents in Fosgate for bringing this to us and urging us as a council to take further forward steps, take forward steps that will further improve their thriving city centre neighbourhood. As a Labour administration, we are committed to creating safe, healthy and accessible streets that are not choked up with traffic and choking the people walking and wheeling down them. Yeah. Increased pedestrianisation is one way of achieving the wider aims of reducing the number of vehicles on our roads and improving air quality. <clears throat> we need traffic arrangements in place in Fosgate that work for everyone. To support businesses in the street, of which many are local and independent, as they continue to recover from the consequences of the pandemic and face the ongoing struggles of increased costs to support residents, the staff are working, the businesses and visitors too, to make their experience of the streets safer, healthier and far more enjoyable. Right. On behalf of all those who signed the petition, I urge consideration of all the traffic options for Fosco. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, we appreciate that. Just bear with us for a, for a moment. Um, I think we will we will continue with the meeting. It, it may be helpful as we've done before to remain seated when speaking. The microphones will then maybe uh, be more effective for us. Would that be helpful, Richard? Okay. So just concluding that uh, section, in accordance with the council procedure rules, uh, these petitions will be referred to Corporate Service, Climate Change and Scrutiny Management Committee. Uh, we come to item six, the report of the executive leader and subsequent questions. I invite the leader, Councillor Douglas, to present her written report. You'll find this at item six of our agenda, as you will be aware. Uh, standing orders allow five minutes, both for the presentation of the leader's report and further five minutes for any response by other group leaders. Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Lord Mayor. 
And the past two months have been a tremendously difficult time for communities across York, rocked and traumatised by the events in Israel and Gaza. I've been honoured to have sat alongside faith and community leaders in our city supporting their own communities and those from others during this period and want to thank everyone for their patience, compassion and understanding. This isn't easy for anyone and we must recognise what holds us together rather than drives us apart. I will continue to try to represent the position I best can that allows our communities to continue to live, work and pray alongside each other. We remembered our lost service personnel and for the first time in York, service animals on the 12th of November. Those who have given their lives to our country in conflicts around the world in recent times and past centuries. And I was over the moon to meet yet again our Normandy veteran Ken Cook, He's one of the most inspirational people I've met in our city and attends as many community events as the Lord Mayor and I do. His vitality, spirit and community activity is tr <laughs> truly awe-inspiring. And thank you to all the serving per service personnel and veterans that make York their home. You are an invaluable and highly respected part of our city community. Picking some of the highlights from my report, I thoroughly enjoyed being able to join the York Valkyries Rugby League team for the celebrations to mark their success in winning the Women's Rugby League Super League title. An amazing win over the Leeds Rhinos and congratulations to them all. The club has since then taken another vitally important step forward within Rugby League and has signed professional contracts with the players the first of their kind in women's rugby league in the country. We are so fortunate to have this level of women's elite sport in our city and the financial backers to enable the club and the team to make steps towards the next level in performance. I wish them all the best for the new season starting in 2024. It was fantastic to see the business community of York and North Yorkshire come together at the local enterprise partnerships business summit held in York last month. The opportunities and challenges of devolution and moving to a combined authority with an elected mayor were the focus. And there is a real sense of op optimism around the economic and infrastructure development opportunities this will bring our region. The business community is very focused on getting the right mayor in the, the right place who will represent us all to Whitehall, arguing for investment in our region, bringing members from different political parties together under a shared entrepreneurial and ambitious vision and putting the benefit of the region above party politics. It will be interesting to see the campaign for the mayor take off in the coming months. The outcome of the election will be tremendously important for us all sat in here. So please make sure you follow the campaign and commitments of the candidates. <laughs> the city partner council plan launch took place in West offices a couple of weeks ago and council officers, my executive, men, executive members and I welcomed around 50 of our city partners from across the business, civic society, education, health, voluntary and development sectors to learn more about our commitment to equalities, affordability, climate and health each for each and every one of us to hear about our priority actions to be taken forward and consider how we can all work together to fulfil the aims and ambitions of our fantastic city. The sense of optimism and the can-do collaborative approach was great to see. The feedback was very positive with a nom number commenting that West Offices has, after a number of years, opened up its front doors again and let the city in. Long may it continue. Finally, I come to the most pressing issue our council has faced, finance. The, the absolute lack of support for local authorities in the Conservatives' autumn statement yesterday was breathtaking. When we're seeing and hearing about councils across the country either not being able to produce a balanced budget or struggling very hard to do so, it's astounding to me there was nothing in there to help seconds. tackle the increase in costs, demand and complexity of cases in adult social care and children's services. There is no doubt we were left a financial mess by the old Liberal Democrat Green administration, increasing strain on one-off reserves year on year with no concerted effort to bring the underlying causes under control. And goodness me, do we now have an uphill battle. Thank you.
But as, as everything else, we're getting on, we're doing, and that's exactly what the people of York want. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Douglas. I'm expecting that uh, leaders of other groups will want to respond. Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Lord Mayor. We would like to unite with the leaders' comments about the situation in Gaza and Israel. This is an extremely worrying time for those that live in the region. It is clear that there needs to be a ceasefire so that humanitarian support can be delivered to those in Gaza and that we should work towards a two-state solution, recognising that can only be achieved with the removal of Hamas from power. I also had the pleasure of attending the Remembrance Service. During my family holiday this year, I had the opportunity to stop at Dunkirk and visit the World War II cemeteries. It was a chastening experience, but an opportunity to demonstrate to my children the reality of war and its human cost. Never has it been more important to reflect on the maxim that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. We congr congratulate the York Valkyrie team on their success. The work the rugby club has done to raise the profile of the women's game is worthy of significant recognition alongside the success of the club on field and in our communities. Our professional sport clubs are a credit to the city and our key community assets. I'm sure Council is looking forward to debating the motion later in support of the Fair Game campaign. The first game I ever attended was in the FA Cup. City's finest achievement may well have been holding the incredible Liverpool team of the 1980s to two consecutive draws in the FA Cup. It was neither of these games that I attended, but the 7-0 replay defeat at Anfield. I was glad the results last week were significantly better as members of my group and I had the pleasure of watching York triumph over Chester. The leaders' report updates us on progress of the council plan. What it shows is the reality of governing versus easy manifesto pledges we all knew were unachievable. Despite maintaining the rhetoric and seeking to rewrite history, reality is failing to deliver on those promises. We were promised before that every primary school child would receive a free school meal. We welcome the delivery of free school meals at Westfield and we support the ambition for national government to extend this to all primary schools. But Councillor Lomas's suggestion last week that allocation of £100,000 per annum will deliver their pledge is fooling no one. A promise made, a promise that will be broken. You stated before the election you had a partner lined up to deliver this pledge. Where is this money and where is the fund to deliver, given the recent report clearly states the York Fund is not it? In keeping with the approach of the council leader, we have drafted a joint letter to be signed by myself and Councillor Douglas, calling on Keir Starmer to reinstate your National Party's commitment to free school meals. On affordable housing, we were led to believe that this was going to be a transformational way of building decent homes that people could afford. Unfortunately, the decision at the last executive meeting will result in between plus 13 and minus 42 additional affordable homes. Borrow more, deliver less. It's no surprise that the media report focused on the 4,000 affordable homes to be delivered through the Lib Dem local plan, not the decimation of the council's housing delivery programme. Councillor Pavlik inherited a pipeline of 420 homes. His report brought forward only 140, less than a third. Another promise was made to deliver well-paid jobs. With LNER giving up on inward investment into York, there's a real risk other companies and industry will decide not to take the time and resource to invest in York. In opposition, the Labour group was seen as a block to development. York Central, the NRM, Station Gateway, Castle Gateway, York Outer Ring Road, even the local plan. Concerns are already being raised that York appears close to business. On devolution, the Liberal Democrat group support the confirmation of capital and revenue in the report. This is the culmination of the work of the previous administration alongside North Yorkshire. This was successful in securing almost 50% of the funding available. Residents will be watching closely to ensure York continues to receive its first share of default funding going forward. Liberal Democrats stand ready to engage fully with the budget process. We urge the administration to be as open as the last so all councillors can ensure that the cuts this administration make don't fall on York's most vulnerable, as their emergency budget did. Liberal Democrats would also urge the administration to drop their deeply unpopular green bin tax. Residents are still suffering from the cost of living crisis, and this is exactly the wrong time to add an additional charge. With current figures equivalent to around an additional 2.5% increase to council tax, this administration may well be asking the residents of York to accept a 7.5% increase in their council tax bill next year. This despite promising every household that a vote for Labour in May was a vote for 0% council tax increases. Another promise made, another promise broken. 30 seconds. It's been a sharp learning curve for this administration and they're rightly reflecting on the differences between opposition and administration. This does mean making difficult choices, perhaps even admitting and apologising for mistakes, 
but doesn't have to mean totally abandoning principles. I'll therefore end by reflecting on the wise words of Councillor Callum Taylor in a previous council motion supported unanimously by all his colleagues at the time. Constructive challenge shouldn't be dismissed as playing party politics and can in fact lead to better decision making. Now more than ever, decision making needs to improve and we must ensure Thank best you. value for money for all residents across the city. Thank you, Councillor Eyre. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, not, not a huge amount to add, but to continue the positive uh, theme yeah, as we, we all work together, I will make some comments. Um, I will say on the Israel-Palestine issue that clearly it's all wrong. Clearly all the loss of life is... Um, is wrong. Um, but I, I don't think, you know, from, from my point of view, we have to come out as a council, what can we actually do on it? And I, and I think that residents do genuinely, in the majority of cases, expect the council to concentrate on council business rather than sending out the latest message on our views on the, the Middle East. Um, obviously, we had the Remembrance Service and, you know, I have to say, um, although it's great the leader and the deputy leader have put in their report, the important remembrance and the uh, Normandy veterans. Um, and I speak as somebody who used to uh, watch the remembrance service a lot on TV when I was young. And it genuinely massively saddens me that the, the, the thousands and thousands of second world war veterans that I used to watch on TV, mm. you know, are, are no longer with us. Mm. Genuinely massively saddens me. Obviously at a level, it's a grandparent gone. Um, but, you know, I think the world is, a, the country is a lot poorer um, for them on uh, York Valkyrie, uh, yep, great success, and it, it's happy to. I'm very happy to pay tribute to the, the great work they've done. As Councillor Ayres talking about his um, footballing history uh, or what he's watched, I mean, clearly York winning three 0 at Old Trafford in the early '90s was the greatest moment. Uh, but I actually went to see York away at Darlington a few years ago. I was in the pub beforehand, and York City fans were ch were chanting, "We are by far the greatest team the world has ever seen," and we worked out. But at that point, York languishing in the northern, the uh, National League North, were actually the worst professional team probably anywhere in the world. So, you know, rather than be the greatest team, it was actually, in fact, the worst team ever. Um, uh, so on the um, actual substance, the problem, most of it obviously is positive. Uh, the work the council leaders done um, and all good. However, however, we do see that gap between the manifesto, as Councillor Eyre has, has discussed, the free school meals. Um, people didn't vote for the Labour administration based on the extent of a trial being done as we as we are now seeing they voted for the Labour administration for free school meals for all primary schools. Indeed, I'm a school governor. I remember actually telling the governing body that there was going to be free school meals for all children because that's what was stated. So there is that sort of delivery gap. Devolution is indeed very important. We'll wait to see what happens there, obviously. Assuming Keane Duncan uh, gets mayor as the best candidate, um, then look forward to working with him. He's set out a true vision, quality sort of statement, and everybody else playing catch up at the moment. So I welcome the council leader's uh, implied endorsement of Keane and the work he's doing. Um, and finally, on on financing, um, yeah, absolutely. This is the biggest issue that there is a real lack of money in local government. There would be a real lack of money. Whoever was in power in local government, it's not going to change. But I think we've got to say again, what are we as a city doing about this? And I would welcome the chance to engage positively with the Labour leadership um, about any of these tough decisions. I've had no offers of any way I can assist so far, but that remains the case on these sort of tough decisions. I'm sure Councillor Eyre would engage positive. Well, OK, but but <laughs> I, I would engage positively wherever possible on, on, the, on the sort of tough decisions. But you know, looking at a couple of such examples, we had the autumn statement. It didn't, in the council interview, have anything good for York. Was it expected to? You know, it's an autumn statement. You wouldn't expect that. That's not, but how much have we gained from the fact that we've had a council press release telling us, in the views of the council leader and the executive member for finance, how bad it was? Or well, we've taken up several officers' time for several hours. That has a literal cost of hundreds of pounds putting out that. Uh, it's been released, so we could have done without that. And on details like the Castle Gateway project, which uh, the Conservative group has, has rightly called in, and there's going to be a, a look at that. You know, the, we'll, we'll discuss that in more detail in a week or so, but the vast amounts of money that are spent on these projects, and if you look at the Castle Gateway report, we've got a million here, we've got a million here, and we've got two million here. Those are the three headline figures. You know, you have to ask yourself about how money has been prudently spent. And this is the Lib Dems as well, I'm afraid, the historic 
decisions, you know, how money is being spent when we're looking at such ludicrously round figures seconds. as the three biggest figures being two million, one million, and one million. And we have to get on top of finances in every way. It can't just be the some areas we spend vast amounts of money and some areas where we just, you know, carry on with absolute business as usual. So that's it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Douglas, do you wish to respond? Yes, please, uh, Lord Mayor, and thank you to both Councillor Stewart and Councillor Eyre for your comments. And I'm glad that we agree on so much. I mean, let's all uh, celebrate we, our city. We've got such fantastic things going on here, haven't we? But we do have challenges. And I suppose this might be the difference between the Labour administration and those that have come over the past eight years, that we all see what the problems are outside the door. We can see that Gillygate is snarled up. We can see or we hear about the air quality. We know people in York cannot afford to live here anymore. Rents are getting unachievable. Housing availability and affordability is sky high. The, the availability is low, affordability high. We have to do something about it. And this is the difference. We don't sit here recognize the problems and just do nothing, which is essentially what we had during the Liberal Democrat and Green administration. Transport plan, nothing. Fought for four years to do nothing about it. Affordable housing. Oh yes, let's sell four or five hundred thousand pounds houses into the private market. That council land is ours. Once it's gone, it's gone. And we are putting 100% truly affordable housing on that for the people of York. Ordnance Lane is a prime example. Four sites, Councillor Eyre. That's what we spoke about in that, um, that, that report that you're talking about. The rest of them are coming. Do not fear. Ordnance Lane, we've reprofiled it. Gone from 50 affordable houses to 100 in one go. That's what we're doing. We're working with partners. We're delivering on it. And, you know, we're not going to be able to do everything with a snap of the fingers. And quite frankly, as I say to the people of York, if I could do that, you'd be worried. So we have to take our time on some things. We have to get it right. Free school meals is one of those, but we are doing it. The city is engaging. It's coming. Don't worry. You're going to love it. You'll get involved. And I really invite you in. And then finally, just to finish off on the finance situation, I totally agree with you on the projects that were coming forward. Castle Gateway is a prime example. That was poor decision making back over the last administration. Multi-storey car park. £14 million of investment going nowhere. Business case didn't add up. We've stopped it. We can't go ahead with the building on uh, Castle Mills at this point in time because it is not financially viable. We have to find alternatives. We've got a combined authority coming, hallelujah, that will bring investment into the city and allow us to put good quality public realm with green space, not just all concrete, on the eye of your and we are looking at parking as well. We're going to make sure that people can get into the city. Councillor Kilbane's focusing on the transport plan. Basically, we're doing what you lot didn't do for eight years, and we are loving every minute of it. Shame the finances aren't good, and trust me, they are not. We haven't got any reserves left. We're not getting help from... We haven't got any available reserves left that we can spend, Councillor Air, because you kept chipping away at one-off spending without attacking the underlying reasons why the overspend was there. We are doing that. We're getting there. And if you want to join us, please come on in. Otherwise, just leave us alone and leave us to get on with it. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. I now invite members to... Question the leader on a report. The procedure rules allow 10 minutes. Councillor <laughs> Healy first. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. That was a bit of a shock. 
Um, the leader's report refers to the establishment of the York Fund and the free school meals pilot programme. The Liberal Democrats support the provision of free school meals for primary school children for a fully nationally funded scheme. At February's full council, Councillor Kilbane said, and I quote, we have the very, we have the very well-known organisations that will put the funding in. Can the leader confirm the identity of the donor organisations referred to by Councillor Kil Kilbane? how much money they have committed to the York Fund, and if it's enough to fund free school meals for every single primary school child by the end of the council term. Great, thank you. And I'm glad you think the York Fund is a good idea because as I've said time and time again, we haven't got any Listen. money to spend on these ambitious, these ambitious programs that we want to deliver and the, the city of York want us to deliver for them as well. So we're having to work in partnership with the city. This is a new way of doing things. I'm sorry if it offends you, but this is life as it is, and it's going to be moving forward in this way. And to be honest, the city is really open to that. We are very fortunate that we have got a civic society that really is open to coming and supporting us to do the ambitious programmes that we want to, and the free school meals is part of that. So... No, I don't think that we said it was fully funded in February. It, it, we just didn't say that. What we said is that we were in conversation with organisations across the city about funding it. And yes, they are coming forward and it's going really well. And you're going to be left behind if you don't get on the programme with this because um, Westfield is going ahead. We'll be going into Burton Green um, primary as well very soon we expect that to happen after Christmas as well and then we hope once we're learning along the way that we will be able to go into more but I keep saying to you we're not going to take sure. risk on this because this is the children and schools in our city so it will be a staged yeah. approach it will be a staggered approach we're doing it it's great the city loves it so I'm happy no supplemental no. Do you have a supplementary? Uh, no. I don't see any other hands for a supplementary. Councillor Nelson. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I was ready to put my hand up again. I forgot. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, in the leader's report, you make reference to the place at Sanderson House in Chapelfield. Um, I was just hoping you could uh, talk a little bit more about how this venue will serve the local community and also whether there's anything else that's happening locally that Westfield Ward residents can benefit from. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Councillor Nelson. Um, and I think everybody across the chamber will agree that this is another excellent example of the city working together to deliver for the communities in York that need it. So the place at Sanderson House is coordinated and funded by private funders through the university. It is a great example of community working for community. And so I'm been really happy to see that the community uh, groups and the activities that were running out of there have continued. And so they're in their early stages. They're opening up for the children of um, the Chapel Fields area. And um, Councillor uh, Webb and I were at Westfield Primary School um, last week and it, we could see all the advertising everywhere. We understand that the place is working with the parents at Westfield Primary to make sure that everybody knows that it's for them and they feel comfortable going in. So that's absolutely fantastic. And it, it's been really great to work with the university's philanthropic department as well on their fundraising. Um, they are helping us with the York Fund, which is fantastic. And uh, we are trying to dovetail the two things. So putting free school meals into Westfield Primary, another great example of money back in the pockets of local people in Westfield, helping to tackle the cost of living crisis in conjunction with the community and our um, large organisations, our anchor institutions around the city, couldn't be better. Thank you. Was there a supplementary or any other supplementaries? No. Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Douglas, in your final hustings appearance before York May's local elections, yes. in response to the ex uh, question from the Executive Director of York Bid, you said that if the Labour group was successful in taking control of the election, you'd be appointing a chief executive for the council. 
Can you please outline the time frame you envisage for this recruitment and when the advert will go live? Thank you, Councillor Fisher. I'd like to say it's a wholly inappropriate question within full, full council and I won't be answering it. Any supplementary? Councillor Rowley? Uh, yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. I was at that hustings and I can say that that wasn't the case. That, that wasn't said by uh, by the leader of the, uh, of the Labour group. Is that a question? Well, it was. No, don't worry. <laughs> Councillor B. Burton. Uh, thank you, Laura. Um, relating confirmation of the master developer for York Central, a decision which we understand is imminent, uh, what does the leader want to see on the York Central and how can she influence decision making around that? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Burton. And um, I'm sure we're all waiting with bated breath, aren't we, to see who the master developer will be. And, and it's been a bit disappointing to us all that the process has been a bit slower than we expected. But I'm really looking forward to seeing that come into place and so that we can start to have those detailed conversations about what the city really wants from York Central. And it's really important that the people of York feel like it is for them. Um, this is another area where the city is telling us that it has been an absolute breath of fresh air to have people, politicians turn up and tell them what they want from York Central. We want good quality jobs on there that everybody can benefit from. We want more green space. We want it to be increased biodiversity in the area, open space, good communities, a sense of place and also affordable housing. And it's really great to see that two and a half thousand potential homes on York Central and the developers that we've been speaking to and our own partners, housing partners, are really keen to see us get some good quality affordable houses on there that are for York people, they're not for investment and they will remain on there for York people. So yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to uh, seeing that decision come through and be able to get on with it. Go ahead. To pick up on the point that you just made then, they're not going to be for investors. How is the council going to ensure that's going to be the case? Because I would imagine that would be illegal. Um, there are ways and means for putting covenants on, but it de depends upon the uh, developer, doesn't it? Obviously, there will be dis decisions, discussions to be made, but where we are the landowner, we can have control over what kind of housing we put on our own land and we own some of it. No further supplementaries. Are there any further questions? Councillor Waters. Mm. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I, was, I was intrigued by a paragraph um, in relation to the devolution and the combined authority when you refer to delivering strategic housing projects which will rely upon our ability as a local authority to work effectively within the combined authority. Would the leader agree that um, that ability to work effectively will be severely hampered if well, it's not just probable, it's not just possible, it's more likely probable the local plan fails. Mm. And if that outcome occurs, will the officers that pushed ahead with the local plan, despite regular and detailed warnings over the subject matter that is causing the inspectors some concern, will they be held fully to account for the fallout? Well, I'm glad you uh, mentioned the York, uh, the local plan, uh, Council of Waters, because, of course, it is tremendously important. And that's why my administration has just ploughed on forward with it. We need a local plan. We cannot get away with not having one any longer. A local plan is better than no local plan. So we're doing everything that we can to get it through the process. I'm hoping that it shouldn't be too much longer, but... We, we need to find a way and that's where we're at. We're not going to pull it out and start from scratch again. Another seven, eight, ten years. It would just be absolutely ridiculous. So, you know, if there's been an element of uh, poor performance or wrongdoing, of course, officers need to be held to account. But at this point in time, there's no indication of that. So we're doing the most we can and I can't wait to see it in place. Thank you very much. That takes us... Go ahead. 
quickly. Just, just, just to try and pin you down on that, are you very concerned as to um, the concerns that the inspectors have raised over one specific issue? I, you know, in a process like this that is so sensitive and takes so long, you would rather see it go straight through, wouldn't you? Of course you would. So any delay is concerning. But at this point in time, we need to keep pushing forward and make sure we get it in. So I wish it was in now. It should have been with us a few months ago and it's not. But, you know, we'll make the best of a bad situation, basically. And we should have had it years ago, shouldn't we, is the, the long and short. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Douglas, you may well now want to move on block the recommendations of the executive to council from the executive meetings held on 12th of October and 16th of November of this year, as contained in the minutes uh, of that meeting set out in the council agenda. Moved, Lord Mayor. Can I have a seconder for that? Formally seconded. Thank you, Councillor Kilbane. Um, I invite debate on any of the recommendations. Please indicate if you wish to speak. I don't see any hands. Nobody wants to speak on this. Councillor Eyre? We're speaking once, just to note that we would, we would not be voting in favour of the executive recommendation on the housing delivery programme due to the lack of information that was contained in the papers. While it may be the right decision, the business cases, etc., were not put forward. So we're certainly not in a position to vote in favour of that one at the moment. Thank you. I don't see any other hands. Um, do you want to reply, Councillor Douglas? If we move to votes. Go ahead. Make a quick reply. Um, just so everybody is aware, that particular minute is about uh, £1.47 million for asylum seeker and refugee housing. So it's really not a very good thing to uh, not approve, I would say, Councillor. Uh, we move on. So I'll now take the votes on each of the recommendations. First vote is the recommendation in minute 46. This relates to the approval of the Youth Justice Plan. I'm intending that we vote by show of hands. And uh, therefore, I'll ask you to raise your hands in just a moment, indicating if you wish to vote for, against, or abstain in relation to this recommendation. And if you're able to keep your hand up long enough, just so that we've done the count, that does help. Those wishing to vote for the recommendation, please raise your hands now. That looks to be unanimous. Yeah, I think that's unanimous. Thank you. That's fairly straightforward. I don't need to ask if anyone's voting otherwise. Well, that's like a vote on the recommendation in minute 61. This relates to the Capital Program Monitor 2. Those wishing to vote for the recommendation, please raise your hands now. Again, that appears to be unanimous. That's helpful. Finally, I'll take the vote on the recommendations in minute 62, relates to delivering more affordable homes. Again, those wishing to vote for the recommendation, please raise your hands now. Thank you. 28 in favour, Lord Mayor. And against, please put your hands down. Those who wish to vote against, those who wish to abstain. Fifteen, Lord Mayor. Twenty-eight votes in favour, fifteen abstentions. The recommendation is carried, and this concludes the executive recommendations. Item seven, report of the deputy leader and questions. Uh, I invite Councillor Kilbane to formally move his written report as set out in the council papers and agenda item seven. Um, happy to formally move the most exciting part of the meeting, Lord Mayor. Do we need that to be seconded? Councillor Douglas is seconded. So members, uh, opportunity to ask questions of the deputy leader on his report. Again, we have up to 10 minutes to do this um, and with the usual supplementaries, Councillor Mason. Councillor Mason. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor, for having a microphone. Uh, 
Okay. Your report, uh, Councillor Kilburn, goes through the uh, constitutional, talked about the constitutional changes. I just wondered who'd been involved in that from your party with the monitor officer in drafting those potential changes. Um, the monitor officer did consult uh, with the uh, leader of the group, uh, and the group consulted with uh, the leader of the group consulted with the rest of the group, and those uh, the results of those consultations were fed back. So, Mr. Lobby, did you have a supplementary? I do. Um, given that three of the four motions tonight are over five hundred words, and obviously some of those are the changes. Uh, is there no concern that those those changes, obviously not the one or two that we've got tonight, but the whole in totality in that review, no concern that might stifle our our um, our role in representing citizens on the council? I think, um, you know, had the constitutional changes taken place already, then we wouldn't actually be having this report. Um, the um, no, it, it doesn't really cause me much concern because there's, you know, it's it, it, these have been through A and G. There's the there is. Uh, a working group on it. And I think what's been quite refreshing uh, with the Labour administration is how more, much more business-like um, these meetings are. Um, there's been far less uh, petty point scoring and long-winded speeches from the top table as we try and talk things out to avoid being questioned. Uh, and we're, the intention is to make these meetings far more business-like so that we can get on with the matters at hand. Um, but I'm sure uh, Councillor Mason, your group, will have Every opportunity to to import uh, to to have inputted and debated uh, on this through the various uh, uh, ways that we can do that within the council. Thank you. No further supplementary. Supplementary, councillor. Thank you, Chair. I would reflect that the the last administration did bring these to a working group prior to bringing them to A and G, with Councillor Pavlovic leading on that particular piece of work. So, given that this is your group's position that came to A and G. Do your group believe that it is democratic to remove members' rights to ask questions to the executive about important issues that do not arise from reports to council? I mean, Councillor Eyre, you're very welcome to ask me any questions any time you want, um, and we will answer them. Uh, just, you know, rather than doing it in the... Th I mean, do you particularly want to do it in the theatre of full council? Is that is that is that a particular sort of fetish that, that, that you have, or... Is it, you know, I don't understand where this democratic deficit is is coming in at all, to be honest. As I say, this is about making uh, these meetings business-like uh, and less of a staged performance. Thank you. I'm sure there were hands that I didn't catch. I did count, catch Councillor Fenton's hand before. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it's in relation to the establishment of the combined authority, that's referenced in the report. Um, it's unfortunate that today, due to the timing of the meetings, uh, members of scrutiny haven't had the opportunity to uh, have pre-decision input prior to decisions being made. <clears throat> and the forthcoming economic framework is one such. Um, can the deputy leader please reaffirm his commitment to ensuring that members of this authority from all parties will have the opportunity to have meaningful pre-decision input wherever possible uh, and going forward, how do you think we can best achieve that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Councillor Fenton. Um, I think uh, absolutely, um, I think we, we've done more uh, pre-decision scrutiny in, in the last six months um, than, than we had previously. Uh, it's definitely uh, the best way, I think, of trying to influence the eventual outcomes because it gives more time for consideration of alternative views. Uh, ideally, we would be looking at pre-decision scrutiny now going into the mayoral combined authority. Uh, there is currently an issue, though, which is to do with um, political sensitivities. In the, um, It's really important at the moment, uh, before the combined authority is formed, that information is released to both parts of the authority. So if we had York, for example, uh, debating something a long time before North Yorkshire or vice versa, uh, then that could cause some sensitivities within, you know, access to information or decision making, etc. So I think we need to be making sure that we're respectful of both combined, both authorities uh, going into going into the process at the position that we're at now. Uh, once the combined authority is formed, which uh, should be uh, mid mid January, should should be the should have gone the process should have gone through Parliament by then. Uh, then we will certainly be pushing 
uh, for pre-decision scrutiny wherever possible, um, being as open and transparent about all of the decisions that that, that, that we are making uh, as, as, as we can be. And I think that is more than um, uh, certainly uh, this council has been in the past. I think we need we do need to get out there, but we need to do that in consultation and with agreement with the other uh, authority within within that combined authority. But you know, so from what our experience so far, uh, we've worked very well with our conservative colleagues on on the combined authority, and they are of the same mind in terms of openness and accountability and input from members when it comes certainly when it comes to policy making, etc. So yeah, no, very very up for that. Any supplementary? Any further questions? No further questions. Okay. We'll move on. Um, so thank you, members. That concludes the questions. And we move on very shortly to motions on notice. I think we've got quite quarter to the night. Quarter. time to do at least the first of those before we take a break. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we move on to agenda item uh, eight. We have four motions on notice submitted, understanding order B13. Uh, these are included in the list of notices of motions and amendments in the agenda supplement. The first relates to recognizing and supporting York's neurodivergent adults. I invite Councillor Rose to move this motion. Up to five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I'd like to note a content warning for suicide in what I'm about to say. Um, I'd really like to open by saying a huge thank you to the many people involved in the creation of this motion, uh, including numerous experts from Healthwatch York and York Disability Rights Forum to clinical psychologists and people impacted by this situation. Um, it mattered deeply to everyone I spoke to and it matters deeply to me. I don't intend to repeat my concerns with the pilot itself. Um, I raised them and explained them on the Health and Wellbeing Board last night. Um, I believe that we as a council could and should do more to improve citywide neurodiversity support and services, including genuinely understanding and taking responsibility as a council for statutory requirements in the Autism Act 2009 and its 2015 update. I think we can be better at ensuring that neurodiversity is always considered when, in, when considering equalities, including ensuring that equality impact assessments address invisible disabilities and ensuring that we as councillors call out issues when we see them. We passed a motion unanimously supporting the social model of disability to show that we understand that our actions can disable people who would otherwise not be disabled. In large part because of societal barriers, British adults with ADHD are between 30 and 120% more likely to be unemployed than neurotypical adults, and almost 80% of autistic adults are unemployed. This is why I'm excited about the prospect of reading and supporting a new neurodiversity strategy. And I think a key part of it is ensuring that we have guardrails to ensure it remains up to date, um, unlike the latest autism strategy that lapsed two years ago. I'm also keen for us to ensure that as we progress, we're mindful of health disparities for neurodiversity. Um, given that people who die by suicide have autism rates 11 times higher than the general population, that a quarter of women with ADHD have attempted suicide, and that 15% of people hospitalized after attempting suicide had a diagnosis of autism. Because of poor support, we should be making sure these gaps close over time and hopefully the public health team can help us measure it as well as help us deliver it. And we heard in public, particip uh, public participation about someone spending 10 hours in hospital because our services didn't do enough for them. Um, thank goodness that situation wasn't worse. Um, they said, when you have met one neurodivergent person, you've met one neurodivergent person. Every person has different needs. Every mind works in a different way. This is why good training is so important. And neurodivergent people also mask their own symptoms to get by in society, often without realizing it. This is also why misdiagnosis is so common, particularly among women who are mis misdiagnosed up to 80% of the time with things like BPD, anxiety, and bipolar, with a joint diagnosis of autism and ADHD becoming more common now that it is more commonly known about. A citywide strategy that tackles this wider challenge is therefore the right next step. I would like to call out that we can't achieve good quality services across the board without more government funding, which this motion acknowledges. All of health is impacted by it from dentistry to cancer, but neurodiversity is one of the worst impacted. And our current national government has given us the worst health services and the highest national debt in over 50 years through countless bad decisions. 
But even without that much needed investment, we know that we can be better because the city supports it. Residents, experts, healthcare staff and the council. Particularly, I've seen an overwhelming interest from the autism and ADHD communities in driving this forward. So I'm really optimistic that we can do much better as a city, even within our limited means. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rose. Somebody, thank you very much. We have a, a second. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, and uh, thank you to Councillor Rose for bringing this motion forwards uh, to the speakers who spoke here and at the Health and Wellbeing Board yesterday and at previous meetings about the impact um, that this is having on them, their lives and their families. Uh, I'd also like to thank Health Watch, who uh, pulled together the original report. Uh, and the York Disability Rights Forum, who've also done a huge amount of work okay. to look at the, um, the the diagnosis pathways and what it means for people in the city. Um, it is clearly an important issue. Um, and just to update the speakers, the, the autism uh, strategy is, the work on that is, is underway um, as part of a wider piece of work on uh, neurodiversity and how we, um, work and support people on that across the city. Um, but as Councillor Rosa set out in his motion, there this is a challenging environment. Uh, there is increased demand both for assessment and diagnosis, but also for other services and support for people across the city. And so it's really important that we work together with partners and others to try and improve awareness, but also just kindness and understanding so that people with autism and ADHD uh, are properly supported. I'm completely committed to ensuring that the city is a more welcoming and inclusive place for everybody. And I welcome this motion and the issues that it raises. I hope it will um, secure some cross-party support to ensure that we can work collaboratively to make our city a, an inclusive and tolerant place for all residents. Uh, thank you to Councillor Rose for putting all this work into the motion and I hope people will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coles. And I understand notice has been received of an amendment to the motion set out in the supplementary papers. Uh, Councillor Runciman, I think you're going to move the amendment? Indeed, Lord Mayor. I'm pleased to be able to speak in this debate and propose a Liberal Democrat amendment to the motion. It might help the Council to know some of the history of the previous administration's actions when it relates to neurodivergency. The previous autism strategy was created in consultation with local residents. It is really important that York now reviews this strategy with those with lived experience. Everyone should be involved in making York a more inclusive place, helping to ensure that people who are neurodivergent can get the assistance that they need and when they need it. The powerful speeches made by residents at last night's Health and Wellbeing Board underlined it, and you have heard two of them speak tonight. The Liberal Democrats as an administration took the important decision in February to include in their budget 100K for support for neurodivergent people. So it was concerning to us to see in September that the administration took away this funding leaving it unclear if we will see this money spent. When and how will we see the alternative sources of funding that the administration promised for this? However, we have seen the administration is willing to find the money in relation to growth budget projects we identified in the February budget. Earlier this month, the Executive Member for Health and Wellbeing and Adult Social Care found 75K of the 100K Liberal Democrats placed within the budget to deal with issues surrounding drug and alcohol misuse. This came from the Public Health Reserve. We would ask the question that if money can be found in the Public Health Reserve to help address the problem of drug and alcohol misuse, then if the political will is there, will they find the money for supporting neurodivergent people? We're asking the Labour administration today to use this opportunity to announce that they will guarantee that they will find alternative sources of funding for that 100K agreed in February. This would support crucial services so that better mental health and well-being can be promoted 
and better support provided to our neurodivergent residents. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Is there a second, Councillor Mason? Formally seconded, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Would anyone, anybody like to speak to this, Councillor Lomas? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and, and thank you, Councillor Runciman. I think that was part speech for the motion um, with a lot of detail on why you want to support the motion uh, as, well as, as well as supporting your amendment. Um, we can't accept this amendment um, because it asks us to do something which is frankly impossible. Um, it's not possible for us to guarantee that we're going to find um, a hundred thousand um, pounds. Such such pennies do not exist down the back of the sofa. The original spending commitment made in the February uh, budget made by the Liberal Democrat Green administration was actually borrowing. So it's wrong to say that it was funded. It was borrowing, um, and that's not sustainable financially. And we've talked quite a lot in recent meetings about the financial situation that this council faces, having to make significant cuts in year to balance the budget that was set in February by the old Liberal Democrat Green administration um, and facing year on year cuts for the next four years. Um, so I will not guarantee that we will find a hundred thousand pounds down the back of the sofa. However, I am certain and very confident that the executive member and officers are already looking at ways that we can provide support to those who most need it. Um, in fact, that's the reason we were elected and that's what we've been doing every day, day in, day out since we were elected. Um, so I can give that guarantee, but we can't support the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to help the Labour members in case they wanted to actually support this, this particular amendment. So the executive member said the money put into the budget was from borrowing. It wasn't from borrowing. It was £100,000 allocated from the Venture Fund. The venture Fund does not have to be repaid. The Venture Fund is a pot of money the Council has. It's often not repaid. That's entirely at your discretion as to whether you choose to pay money back into the Venture Fund. If you want to have a discussion about what the Venture Fund is for and why it was set up, I'm happy to I'll leave that to you. Even if you don't wish to use the venture funds to find this particular pot of funding, £100,000, which is allocated for two years' worth of support, there is other money available. As was mentioned by Councillor Runciman at the recent decision session on substance misuse, the £100,000 that was allocated in the venture fund for substance misuse, after conversations with the, with the finance officer, pointed out this was not available for the executive member to use for that particular pot of funding. There was an update at the meeting to say that that funding would be found from the Public Health Reserve. The Public Health Reserve currently sits at around about, I think, just over £1 million. So the funding that is there, if you wish to use this funding as Labour councillors, we definitely believe that that funding shouldn't be sitting in reserves, but should be used to help the people that are speaking to us today and all of those people in York. It's not borrowing. The money is sitting there as part of £31 million of earmarked reserves. Thank you. Any other contributions to the debate? I don't see any. Councillor Rose, do you want to respond? Uh, not to the amendments. You don't want to respond to the amendments? Okay. <laughs> wasn't clear. That's helpful. That means we can move to a vote on the amendment. Those who wish to vote uh, in favour of the amendment, please raise their hands now. Include my name. That's 19 in favour. Those who wish to vote against. Twenty-five against. The Any abstentions? No abstentions. So the amendment is not carried, and we return to the original motion. Um, we move to the debate on the substantive motion. Uh, does anyone wish to speak on this? Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I don't think I need to sit down for my voice to be amplified. Before the, three I... minutes... Before... <laughs> Before the three minutes start, can I just say um, that uh, I'm about to tell my daughter's story. She is aware that I am speaking tonight, although I won't mention her by name. Um, but I just wanted to just... Uh, 
uh, allay any fears that members might have had. Right, that's 20 seconds. Uh, in 2006, my wife gave birth to our fourth child. After three boys and an eight-year gap, we now had a daughter. Little did we know just how our lives were going to change from that point. The boys' upbringing seemed to be a doddle. They were all into the things that young boys were into, and we never had sleepless nights, terrible twos, or toddler tantrums. They seemed to breeze through their school years and have grown into fine young men that we are immensely proud of. Our daughter, on the other hand, seemed different. Again, we didn't have the sleepless nights, terrible twos, or toddler tantrums. However, within the first 12 months, we noticed that her head shape seemed different to our other children. Following a referral to the specialist in Leeds, she was diagnosed with a condition that meant the four skull plates had fused together early. So, at the age of 12 months old, she went through major skull reconstruction surgery. Excuse me. Thankfully, this was successful. But as she developed further, we noticed that she seemed to have irrational fears. She refused to go on escalators, calling them scaregulators. She had screaming fits when going into a lift. That's the same reaction to hand dryers in a lady's toilet. Again, uh, she would scream and run away from loud industrial lawnmowers. And finally, anyone dressed up in costume caused her to have a meltdown. Visits to see Father Christmas were definitely off the Christmas calendar. Her gait was clumsy, and she sometimes took time to analyse things and answer simple questions. Initially, we thought this was down to her neurosurgery and just lived with it. She went through her primary school with just a handful of friends, often spending long times on her own, not wanting to ask others if she could join in. She was placed on the SEND register, but received no specialist support. She transitioned to secondary school with those same issues, yet seemed to settle into the routine and structure perfectly. In 2021, we spoke to our GP about some of these issues. They referred us to CAMS for an initial assessment. After 21 months of waiting, she finally had her assessment that gave a formal diagnosis of autism. This answered a whole lot of questions for us as parents. Everything now seemed to fall in place. Neurodiverse people see, hear, and interpret the world very differently. Our daughter's diagnosis came too late for the school to apply for an EHCP, which would have given her more time and support in her exams and would have enabled her to wear ear defenders to shut out background noise. <clears throat> 21 months is far too long, and hopefully this motion will help to address this. Thankfully, without this support, she did get the results she needed for sixth form. Thank you. The Conservative group fully supports this motion and will vote for it. We hope that a city who not only Thank acknowledges you. neurodiversity, but also takes positive action to enhance the experiences of neurodivergent individuals like my daughter will be the first step in creating Thank a society you. who genuinely understand, accept and support people who, like my daughter, long to live a normal, fulfilling... Thank you, life. Councillor Rebel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that contribution. Are there uh, other members who wish to speak at this point? Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Like Councillor Rowley, I know a little bit about bringing up a child with neurodivergent conditions. Um, it took months, years even, to get a diagnosis in the case of my family member. Um, we eventually had to go private. We were fortunate enough to be able to go private and get a private uh, diagnosis of ADHD and a, di a, a, a prescription for a drug to help deal with the matter. It was a lot difficult process. I fully support this motion. As you know, I, Councillor Orwell and I brought a motion to the council on December the 19th, 2019, which was to make York an autism friendly city. Um, this builds on that. Unfortunately, the problems of getting diagnoses have not improved during that time. It's simply become more and more difficult. I know of people who uh, have children with autis autism who are struggling to get a diagnosis and after three years, and some are not getting the support they need. 
I'm sorry you've rejected the amendment. I believe it, there is no point having money in reserves when it could be put to practical use to support the, the people with neurodivergent conditions. Uh, however, I will be supporting the amendment. Sorry, so, supporting the substantive motion, even though you've rejected the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I, I, I wasn't going to speak on this one, but I think the last speech... It, it's evidence of a of a lack of understanding of the social model of disability to start. But I think we, what I really want to say is young people who are from neurodivergent backgrounds are neurodivergent. Uh, as we heard from one of the public speakers, you've met one neurodivergent person, you've met one neurodivergent person, and everybody is different. I... As you know, I'm, I care passionately about education for all. And I think it is incredibly challenging for the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative group to talk about money about this when since 2010, austerity has really damaged our education system and the ability to support young people, whatever their background, whatever their challenges, whatever their needs. I think it's so important that we do what we can as administration, that we do what we can as a council, but we must not forget the underlying problem that austerity has done so much damage. Please don't forget that. We need to do what we can, but we cannot forget that dark spectre that looms over everything we have to do in this city. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't seen any other members wishing to speak, so... No? Councillor Rose, um, if you want to respond I... at this point before we take a vote. Thank you. But before I start my time, can I... Just say thanks to those who shared personal stories and also know I've been sent speeches by people who couldn't be here, who missed the deadline uh, registering too late today. Um, I can't read them, um, but it's pretty common for people in this group of, of people. So I just wanted to uh, mention that they're all as emotive as what we've heard today. Um, th the World Health Organization says that autistic people have the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standards of physical and mental health but that autistic people are often subject to stigma and discrimination, including unjust deprivation of healthcare. They and we know that this applies to all neurodivergent people. It's critical that we fully understand this situation, which is why it's already been raised at scrutiny and the Health and Wellbeing Board. And I'm very pleased to hear that the work on the strategy has already started. It's even more critical that MPs and the government understands it. As I've said before, the problem is fundamentally caused by a lack of funding of our council, our NHS, our ICB, our partners, our diagnosis pathways, staff, bed support, because of decisions by our national government. I'd love to talk about increasing funding. Uh, I will continue to talk about, all, uh, talk about it to all parties I can, but I'm keen to make sure we only spend money that actually exists in real life. Um, four years for the fastest diagnosis path is too slow. That needs funding to solve it. So I'd like to urge our Conservative Councillor colleagues and Conservative MP to support us in creating a more inclusive and safe city by raising this with their national leadership to secure more investment in this area. Personally, I eagerly await a Labour government that will undoubtedly deliver the necessary improvements that residents and experts are calling for. But beyond that point, I stand by the points raised by everybody involving the public in making our city more inclusive and improving our services. Um, and I look forward to working with residents on this issue in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rose. We are now in a position to take a vote on this motion. Uh, so again, if I could ask you to raise your hand, if you were uh, wanting to support this motion, please raise your hand now. That is, I'm sure, unanimous. We'll take a break. We'll have an amendment for 15 minutes. Amendment? Adjournment. <laughs> we can have an amendment if you like it. Yeah.
of our uh, motions on notice, I invite Councillor Smalley to present the second motion relating to a national campaign which seeks to reform the way in which football is managed. Councillor Smalley. Uh, yes. Councillor Hollier is unwell and given apologies. Will that comment? That's a clarify. Do I get extra minutes and extra time? <laughs> the first of many puns, Councillor Smalley. I like it. Can you just make a comment? Amending the motion itself would require council permission, but we could just move that. Thank you for your patience, councillors. Um, just to clarify, amending the motion itself would certainly require council's permission. However, the constitution doesn't talk about the mover of the motion having to be the same individual. Councillor Smalley. Uh, thank you, coach. Oh, sorry, Lord Mayor. <laughs> with with councillor Hollier being ill this evening, he's had to pass the ball to me. Council, lower league football is facing a crisis, a crisis similar to what Maidenhead United will be facing at full time this Saturday. COVID-19 de devastated the revenue of many lower league clubs, but this issue is decades old. Fundamentally, Council, football funding in the UK is not fair. And if there's one thing as Liberal Democrats enjoy campaigning on almost as much as potholes, it's calling for a fair deal for insert industry here. But seriously, Football funding is unsustainable and regulation is broken. Football clubs from York City to Rawcliffe Juniors, Wigginton Grasshoppers to Popperton United are no ordinary organisations. They are historic local institutions that play a key role in the life of our local communities. If the fair game index was applied to York City, its income from TV revenue would rise from 79,000 to 2.62 million. This income could help improve facilities and invest in community projects, such as those already delivered by the York City FC Foundation. To summarise the motion before us, we are calling for five key measures. A truly independent regulator, free from vested interests. A refocus on values rather than profit. The establishment of a fair game index to reallocate the payments made to clubs to reward those which have run well and engage with fans. Four, the regulator to ensure that fans are given a final say on any proposed changes to a club's crown jewels, such as name, colours, badge, etc. And fifth and finally, that football clubs are recognised as key parts of local communities. Now, Council, when we were trying to get this motion on tonight's agenda, advice was originally given that it might not be in order, as the issue might not affect the city in a more general sense, as most cities have football clubs and local authorities have no control or input. Now, if you swap football out for other sectors, such as rail, chocolate, the sciences, we can see the mountain we have to climb to get councils and local authorities across the country to truly engage in football. Now, of course, the council actually has a very real stake in the success of our local club as, clo as close partners in the community stadium. But beyond that, elite sport is a key driver of participation, getting more people involved in sport and physical activity as well as the health benefits, there's tourism, benefits to the local economy, benefits to local pubs, the profile of the city and civic pride. So council, let's not foul on an issue that matters so much to the city. Let's get this motion in the back of the net. And I urge all councillors to use their heads and vote for the motion. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Smalley. Uh, is there a seconder for this motion? Do you wish to speak at this point? Thank you. I'd like to use my speech, um, devoid of football puns, uh, to highlight <laughs> to 
to highlight the great work that York City Football Foundation does to support the women's and girls game. Women's football is one of the top three priorities for the York City Football Foundation. Just last year, they opened a new FA Emerging Talent Centre, as well as continuing a new season for its girls only development centres and FA Regional Talent Club, providing a base for eight to 16 year olds to develop their footballing skills at every level. We have seen some great success in our York City women's team. We've seen them promoted to the fourth tier of English football. And just this month, we've seen the largest attendance for a Minster Bells game in the first round of the Women's FA Cup. It's an exciting time for women's football in England overall. In the last two major tournaments, our Lionesses won the Euros and made the finals of the World Cup. Following these outstanding results, a male friend, and I use the term loosely, told me, it's great for women, but not really the same as the real thing. Lord Mayor, fellow councillors, we still have a long way to go. It is my ambition and the ambition of this motion that we properly fund community football in York, invest in women and youth teams to drive York's team's success and help deliver an inclusive project that builds communities. Football and sport are an integral part of children's development. It's been shown that physical activity is important in the early stages of life as it sets the foundation for growth and contributes to building an array of skills learnt through practice. It is excellent to see the progress of the women's and girls game in York and England as a whole, and I encourage all councillors to vote for this motion so we can ensure the foundation has the resources they need to continue their excellent work. I also had the great pleasure of attending the first round FA Cup tie against Chester with other Liberal Democrat councillors. I believe it's important that we protect York City Football Club as a community asset, protect the investment we made into the stadium, and if the fair game campaign succeeds, that we allow football in York and across England's lower leagues to thrive. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Knight. Um... Does any member wish to contribute here? Please go ahead. And then cast the bed. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, while I'm not a huge football fan, and as a Plymouth Argyle supporter, this is probably best for my mental health, wow. I'm pleased to support a motion that puts communities over profit. Football, and indeed most sports, are incredibly unequal. People at the top get rewarded with huge profits, while those at the bottom struggle. This affects clubs like the brilliant Dunnington FC and York Valkyrie team, who, despite their challenges, have excelled. We need to change the narrative from profit-based profit, profit based to community-based. And of course, everyone should be on a level playing field. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Uh, Councillor Webb. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And um, grudgingly, thank you, Councillor Smalley, for many puns. And thank you, Councillor Knight, for highlighting the women's game. Uh, I think it's really, really important. Um, let me start by saying that the Labour group will be supporting this motion and you won't be surprised to hear that we would be really happy to see a more equal distribution of wealth in the sport. I was going to thank Comrade Hollier for bringing the motion, but uh, unfortunately he couldn't be here, so they had to make a substitute. Um, I used to live over in Clifton, not far from the old Kit Kat Crescent, and I uh, used to really enjoy hearing the crowds on a Saturday afternoon. I remember heading along to a game there and it was absolutely packed with fans. I took my dad and my brother earlier this year to watch a game at the new stadium and I have to say my resounding memory of that day was it was absolutely freezing. Um, and I, but as well as that, I ended up surrounded by lots of my own school students, which I'm sure that they love just as much as I did. Um, I'd like to, to take this opportunity to thank York City for the work that they do in the community as well. Uh, they delivered countless sessions for young people in the city. Uh, they organise toy collections at Christmas. They do school visits. And this community work does not go unnoticed. Organising sessions in Aiken Green, Chesney Fields, Park Grove Primary School, Scarcroft Green, to name but a few. And whilst we're talking about sport, it'd be wrong not to mention all the other sporting communities that play a vital role in our city. A good example of that is the York City Knights and the incredibly successful York Valkyries. 
Uh, these organisations also, also share this am administration's ambition for vulnerable young people and lead on brilliant work to support vulnerable young people in York and the surrounding villages. Further to this, why stop at these relatively larger organisations in York? What about celebrating the great work at Aiken Rugby Club as, as well? Um, in our local communities, there are lots of volunteer-led organisations that do great stuff at a micro level that makes a huge difference to communities in York. Hopefully this motion will give us an opportunity to explore and celebrate what sporting organisations in this city do. And if you look at the last lines of the motion, look at how we can work together to do more. Of course, as we've said all along, this administration is all about partnership work. As we recognise that we cannot do everything on our own that is needed in this city, just seconds. imagine what we could do if this call for action doesn't fall on deaf ears in Westminster and the money in football was fairly shared out. Thank you. Councillor Kilbane. Oh, um, uh, th thank you, Chair. I was expecting Councillor Stewart to go next, but I'm very, very happy to jump ahead of Councillor Stewart. I had uh, a spot in his hand. I would have gone ahead. That's it, that's it for me. Um, just, just, just very briefly, obviously, um, happy to, to support the motion. Um, I was just a little bit surprised um, that it was coming forward in Councillor Hollier's name. Um, obviously, being a uh, football fan uh, throughout the whole of my life, I've had many football conversations with many members uh, over the years in council, but not once has Councillor Hollier uh, mentioned football to me or expressed a preference for any particular football club. Um, now, it, it could just be a coincidence, of course, and he just maybe he doesn't like talking to me or something, but um, it's, um, and I'm sure, you know, Councillor Hollier bringing this motion uh, to support York City Football Club has got absolutely nothing to do with Councillor Hollier's political aims uh, for being the parliamentary candidate uh, for York Outer, because I'm sure that Councillor Hollier wouldn't be so foolish as to do something like that, because clearly uh, the, pub the good public of York can see straight through such naked political tactics. And as we know from, from experience, yeah. Councillor Hollier would never twist a political narrative or make uh, opportunistic political points just to further uh, his own uh, political ambition. So we welcome it. Uh, with open arms, and I am delighted uh, that it is uh, actually Councillor Smalley that has stepped up uh, and taken this forward, because I had the pleasure of going to watch Lincoln City uh, play a few weeks ago. Um, wasn't a great game, to be honest. The last the last 10 minutes was pretty good, pretty exciting. Uh, but my trip to Lincoln uh, was only let down by not spotting Councillor Smalley in the city, cleaning graffiti or picking up litter or whatever else he does uh, for, for the good people of Lincoln. Uh, I did think of buying him a Lincoln City away shirt, uh, which he could wear uh, on the occasion that he visits Rawcliffe uh, and does things around there just so it can remind him uh, of his hometown. So, yes, very happy to, to, to support the motion, uh, even though it goes against my own interests. As a long-suffering, lifelong, cultural Evertonian, uh, I think calling for the abolition of parachute payments not might not serve us very well uh, the following season. However, putting personal sort of hopes to one side. Uh, but also, if I could add that, if we could maybe talk to the Fur Game campaign, because I'm not seconds. sure if it's going far enough, because I think it does, as speakers have said, we need to reach further down the pyramid, really. We need to be looking at the Northern League, the, the Isthmian League, the Southern Leagues, uh, those games that us real football fans go to uh, week in, week out, standing in cold corners of far forgot. As I'm sure Councillor Hollier does on many occasions. Uh, so with that in mind, with that proviso, uh, very happy to, to support a campaign to redistribute the wealth. Uh, very glad that the Liberals are on board with that agenda and we'll see what the Conservatives think of it. <laughs> Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I, I was going to speak, but I think it's important I offer some words of reassurance to Councillor Kilbane that he should not feel left out. Councillor Hollier, who I've known for a number of years, has never discussed football with me. Inexplicably, <laughs> he's avoided this. I'm quite known as a Leeds United fan and to a lesser degree a York City well, should, should, a Leeds United and York City fan. Um, but Councillor Hollier has never raised the subject of any football. Not York, not Leeds. Yeah. Not I necessarily. encourage members to address the, the motion before us. Absolutely, I'm doing there. Um, not on one occasion. Indeed, I would say that most people who have met Councillor Hollier would say he has no interest whatsoever <laughs> at all in football. Councillor Stewart. And so him, being, him not being here, Lord Mayor, 
can only be replaced by <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Smalley, <laughs> who equally has no interest whatsoever at all in football <laughs> and knows nothing about it. Indeed, the only person who could have been more farcical to propose this motion would be <laughs> Councillor Healy, although... Councillor Healy has actually been to one football match because I went with him. Councillor he, Stewart. He brought his copy of The Economist, Lord Mayor. If you I are not say, able to address I the will. motion before us, I will. I will stop at this point. Okay, I will, I will, Please. I will, Lord Mayor. And the point about the motion is that Councillor Healy went with the copy of The Economist and halfway through the second half was surprised the teams had changed ends. Lord Mayor, <laughs> that sums up the Lib Dem ideas about football. So this is nothing more than a, a purely for election leaflets, purely some absurd... Councillor Stewart, thank you very much. No, thank you. But on the motion <laughs> itself... <laughs> on the motion itself, Lord Mayor... Ten seconds. I think we would agree with the content of the motion. But <laughs> Councillor Knight said we should vote for this motion to keep the Football Foundation getting funding, which is absolute nonsense. This motion will change nothing whatsoever. It's good, it's fine. We support the idea of the Premier League teams getting less money, lower league teams getting more. But this will do absolutely nothing. It is just virtue signaling. And last night, I'll tell you where I actually was. I was at a meeting in Cotmanthorpe with various excellent members of my community talking about how we can improve football facilities in the world. We've got a, a centre called the Rec, and they want to build Rec 2. And it was literally the football club were there, the Rec were there, and I was broadly there watching. I'm not taking the credit. I was just watching and learning what they were doing. And I said to the people there, I said, well, actually, you might be interested to know the council is debating tomorrow a motion on football and football financing and how it works. And one of them said to me, Lord Mayor, he said, why can't the council stick to running the council? And I couldn't have put it better myself. Councillor Oral. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Just to put the record straight, Councillor Kilburn or Councillor Stewart have never talked to me about football either. Yeah. And I will be quite happy to talk to them about, about, about football. My father put me over the terraces in uh, Deepdale when I was six, and I've been going that, back there periodically ever since. Thank you. Councillor Taylor, do you wish to actually say something about the motion? <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor. It, it, just to make sure I was acting above board this evening, um, a, a lot's been made of the community game. And um, I'm, I, I play for Poppleton United Football Club, so I suppose I should have declared an interest at the start of this meeting. But I did find out this morning that I've been dropped for Saturday's game. So uh, I, I don't think I'm that interested. Uh, so I, I can vote with a clear conscience, I think. Is that it? I, I are we ready to move to a vote on this? You've got two more on the front bench. Councillor Fenton. Councillor Fenton. I, I I disagree with Councillor Stewart in terms of this is nothing to do with the council. I think for, the point that motion tries to make is football is part of the community and the council has partnerships with various organisations within the community. I think it's entirely appropriate that we talk about uh, and champion the, the role of football, not just in terms of uh, in terms of York City Football Club, but in terms of supporting and promoting diversity uh, and, and the inclusion in sport and in football of people from all backgrounds. Um, my, my kind of very small um, <laughs> anecdote to add to those have already been 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 raised is I played in a World Cup. I played in a football World Cup in 2005 in Copenhagen, um, playing for Yorkshire Terriers, which was and still is Yorkshire's uh, premier gay football team. Um, and that was a really uh, life changing experience. I, I, you know, in, in terms of my football was appalling. I was the I was the underused I was the underused substitute. Um, I left Councillor Waller in the in the, so the refreshment. Can, can you also? Um, he can chose, you also he chose not motion, to please. chose not to watch. But I think it, it highlights the importance of um, championing and celebrating diversity in sport. And I think if clubs like York City have, uh, and other lower league clubs have more uh, resources, and they can bring in those underrepresented groups more into the life of of professional and semi-professional sport. So I would urge members to support the motion. Thank you. 
Councillor Healy, is there something <laughs> of real <laughs> substance that you're going to add in that just a sentence or two? If I could make it three sentences, Lord Mayor, that would be most helpful. Uh, just a matter of accuracy in Councillor Stewart's speech. I've actually been to two football matches, one of which uh, a, I think it's called Series A in Italy. Uh, two, um, my daughter now plays for Hamilton Panthers. So any money that can flow down from the higher leagues through the lower leagues down to those grassroots football clubs, um, I would be more... Uh, in favour for. Thank you. And uh, that's my contribution. Thank you. And I will be... Councillor Smalley, do you wish to respond to what you've heard? I, I, do love Bear. I do love oh. Bear and I will be quick. Um, I have to say this has enjoyed a fuller debate than I was expecting. <laughs> um, I'll just quickly run through. Councillor Knight, um, thank you for mentioning, obviously, the women's game and how important that is across York and our wider region and the great work of the York City uh, Club Foundation. Um, Councillor Baxter wholeheartedly agree on putting sport before profit. And Councillor Webb, thank you for um, injecting the debate with memories of Bootham. It's only right. And highlighting how smaller sporting organisations play such a key role um, across York's communities. And Councillor Kilbane, thank you for doing your bit to alleviate York's housing crisis by allowing Councillor Hollier to live rent free in your head. Uh, surely appreciates that. Um, <laughs> and on um and i think you know and councillor fenton i think you know you've done you've done your bits in terms of bringing it back to how we as city of lincoln sorry city of york council <laughs> um can actually improve the lot of clubs right across the city and including um diversity and um and finally just a, a small anecdote as everyone seems to have got theirs in um i actually left a everton ticket on the dashboard of Councillor Hollier's car, um, and somebody smashed the windscreen and put two more there as well. <laughs> so, with that, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. We'll move to the vote now. Those who wish to vote in favour of the motion, please indicate. Thank you. That does appear to be unanimous. We move on. I invite Councillor Whitcroft to move the third motion. This motion relates to working with partners to improve mental health well-being. Councillor Whitcroft, you've up to five minutes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. May I say what an honour it is to introduce my first motion to full council on behalf of the residents of Fishergate and indeed the whole city on such a vitally important topic. Uh, I'm afraid I must also echo Councillor Rose at the start of his motion uh, with a content warning. I will also uh, be talking about suicide in my speech. Lord Mayor, since we last met as a full council, we have celebrated a number of important events related to this motion, including World Mental Health Day on the 10th of October and International Men's Day on the 19th of November. I would like to start by paying tribute to the wonderful work done by mental health charities in York to mark these events for the importance of mental health in our city. In particular, Lord Mayor, I would like to uh, highlight the local charity Mentalness, set up to encourage men to be open about their mental health and stay connected with one another. The charity released a very moving video in support of this year's International Men's Day theme of zero male suicide, and I encourage all of those who haven't to watch it. Lord Mayor, those of us who have seen friends, family, colleagues and loved ones suffer through the agony of mental health crises know and share their pain. The terrible fear that someone you care about can't be their true self or doesn't want to be here anymore, makes all of our hearts sink. As councillors, many, many of us find ourselves on the front line of the mental health crisis, when residents in distress often reach out to us before anyone else, and we must all surely want to help. I brought this motion to full council today to help do my part in championing well-being in the city, and I hope that this can serve as an impetus for strengthening our support for those who are suffering. I also hope that anyone watching at home or here tonight suffering in silence with such issues may take some comfort in seeing this motion pass. You are not alone. Lord Mayor, the facts outlined in my motion speak for themselves. A marked increase in mental health issues across all age groups, the cost of living crisis driving our resilience to breaking point, and suicide, the worst outcome of any mental health emergency, has increased in York over the past decade. Discussing these difficult issues can often feel so futile, I accept that much of what I outline in the resolutions of this motion involves lobbying a government that 
given the absence of mental health reform in the King's speech, has not recently demonstrated proficiency on this issue. However, the work that can be done locally is outlined in this motion. To do our best in the face of York's mental health crisis, working with York Ending Stigma, the Executive Member for Health and Wellbeing, and the relevant council officers can truly make a difference to the lives of some of the most vulnerable people we represent and serve. Working with the charity sector in the way that this motion recommends is in keeping with the new path our administration is seeking to take. It is similar steps that have been successfully taken with the recent establishment of the York Community Fund, which will harness the goodwill of the city towards a brighter future for the children of York. We need to all understand that what we say and do in this chamber and in West offices, whilst important, makes up only a fraction of the work done in York for the public good. Businesses that provide mental health days as a part of their employee benefit, Age UK's befriending service helping to reduce isolation. York Minds mentoring and counselling services, all the crucial support provided across our communities by individuals supporting one another. Or even just a stranger on Lendl Bridge asking a young man stood by the barrier if he is okay. On a final note, Lord Mayor, I'd like to dispel the rumours. No, I haven't just had a hot chocolate. I am in fact trying to take part in Movember. Movember is a national charity dedicated to raising awareness and funds for men's mental and physical health. And as a part of its campaign, it encourages men to grow moustaches to show solidarity with those who suffer in the ways outlined in this motion. Some work colleagues and I decided to take part, but my attempt at facial hair has somehow left me looking even younger. Lord Mayor, I hope this motion will pass with council wide support for the good of the city and for all of those who know someone who suffers from or indeed suffers themselves from mental ill health. In the month of November, let us make a stand for change. Thank you. I'm looking for a seconder for this, this motion. Do go ahead. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Whitcroft, for bringing this motion forward. I'd like to second the motion on mental health. I realise this is a current significant issue for York, just look at the press this week, which tells stories of distressed people near the river in crisis. There's simply not enough national investment for people with complex needs who need support with their mental health. This huge weight for counselling services and the whole of mental health services are underfunded and under-resourced. As I have specialist knowledge around the issues of substance use, homelessness and housing, I'd like to speak about those with direct relation to mental health. People, people with multiple needs have been let down by government. I see daily people who've been let down by a system that's failing. The Health Watch report breaking point in June 2023 advised that it can be incredibly hard or even impossible for people to access mental health services. And that system is letting people down. As it can be very difficult for people to access these services, these difficulties are increased significantly when a person doesn't have access to a phone, an address, or even the means to access services, including any transport to get there. People with limited access to mental health services often attend the emergency department when things come to a crisis point, as they do not have the means to access medical help in any other way. Concerningly, this report also states the ED lacks the capacity to see people with mental health crisis and healthcare providers often display inconsistent and judgmental attitudes. This is further compounded with a lack of understanding of addiction and mental health due to misconceptions. I see people who've regularly been advised that their issues are due to intoxication, that they need to sober up. This sort of thing is judge, a judgmental understanding of addiction and ignores the trauma that may be causing the issue the, uh, around the mental health crisis. There's also poor communication between providers involved with mental health care, which can lead to increased poor outcomes for people where services need to work together to provide the best support and care for people. This increases the pressure on other non-statutory services working with people that they are not equipped to deal with or assist at any level of this, any of these levels of crisis. 30 seconds. We need to deliver better wraparound care for homeless people and people experiencing addiction who are entrenched in a system that's let them down for years. We have the skills, knowledge and commitment to help people who've been let down by a lack of funding. Without urgent action, we will continue to fail some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. 
People have died asking for support that didn't come. Maybe they didn't ask in the correctly defined ways, but we have a responsibility Thank to support you. everyone, regardless of their situation. We have to do better and we will do Thanks. better. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stills Warshaw. And I understand again, there is an amendment being offered to this and Councillor Runciman, please. Thank you, Chair. Lord Mayor, we've seen the Labour Group reject the previous amendment to the neurodiversity mo motion. This asks the Council to request a commitment to find alternative sources of funding for 100K as agreed in the February budget. This was, would support crucial services that promote better mental health and well-being, including those residents on the autism spectrum. We're therefore giving the Labour Party a second opportunity to do the right thing. Motions are easy to write. What is hard is having the strength and political leadership to find the money to fund these essential services. Mental health is an extremely important issue. It's always been a priority for me and for the Liberal Democrat group. We regretted to note that the proposed reforms to the Mental Health Act were shelved in the government's King's speech. Ending stigma around mental health is an essential step to help the one in four adults and one in 10 children that suffer from mental health issues, especially men. It is so important to support York Ending Stigma, formerly known as Time to Talk. And it is essential that mental health charities and service users should be consulted whenever there are changes to mental health support services. However, only so much can be done within the confines of the Labour Administration's emergency budget. But we are at a critical time for a lot of residents' mental health. It's clear that the cost of living crisis is only exacerbating poor mental health. This is why it's exactly the wrong time for the administration to remove the 100k of support, both for those suffering with poor mental health and to provide help for residents on the autism spectrum. We ask that the council agrees to this amendment and that the administration commits to finding alternative forms of funding. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Can I have a second of Councillor Mason? Formally seconded. Thank you. Open to debate. Go ahead. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm speaking against this amendment. I don't question the importance of mental health support for those residents with autism, which is hugely important. Our public speakers earlier explained exactly why this is the case. But the budget proposal was a one-off sum funded from a one-off source of income. It's quite clear the council's finances are in a parlous position and it's possible this discretionary one-off funding may be needed in the future to balance the budget. We will seek alternative funding, but there is no guarantee the alternative is to continue spending without thought to addressing the council's structural financial problems, which would be incredibly irresponsible, something we've seen in recent years and which we must urgently stop. I urge council to vote against this amendment, <clears throat> worthy, of course, though the purpose of the funding is. Thank you, Council Burton. Any other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Proposed amendment. Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll try again. I doubt I'll be entirely successful. Now, in terms of using the Venture Fund, there is precedent for using the Venture Fund. The executive last week used the Venture Fund to fund its mental health housing support. So that's not a fundamental issue you need to worry about in terms of the allegations of borrowing. I think in terms of the one-off nature of the funding, yes, the funding that was put in was one-off, but it was one-off for two years, was the intention of using that to support the voluntary sector, to provide early intervention services that will actually reduce the demand on adult social care. I think looking at it as one-off is not putting it in its correct perspective. Delivering this service, making sure people get the earliest intervention possible will actually save money down the line. It is an investment that is needed for people's lives, and it's an investment that will actually pay itself back many, many times, both in the human 
response and also in council finances. Any other contributions? I did. Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I don't think that the Labour group have actually understood the word alternate. This doesn't necessarily mean that we take the money out of um, council funds. It says seek an alternative source. We can seek an alternative source, or the Labour group can seek an alternative source of funding through the York Fund to provide free school meals for primary school children. Why can they not look at alternative sources of funding out with the council to try and provide this money for this essential service? Thank you. I don't see any other contributions. Councillor Whitcroft, do you want to respond? No, thank you, Lord Mayor. Okay. Then we'll vote on the uh, amendment as has been proposed. Again, uh, if you wish to vote for the amendment, please raise your hands. And those voting, thank you very much. And those voting against the amendment? <clears throat> 24 against, Lord Mayor. 24 against. And I don't think there are any abstentions. No. Left, no. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the amendment is defeated and we continue uh, debating the... Um, the motion as originally put forward. Does anybody wish to speak to this? Councillor Ayer. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It's obviously disappointing that the Labour group has decided not to accept our amendment on the motion. Despite this, the Liberal Democrat group will vote for the motion this evening as dealing with mental health is something that is deeply important to the Council, residents in York and the wider country. I speak as someone who has spent decades working with those suffering mental ill health and from my own personal experience. Each year we led the council, we increased funding for mental health. It has always been our priority. I could talk at great length about the problems in the system, but there simply isn't time. I reflect that it was 13 years ago since we announced there was no health without mental health. The reality is improvement since then has been minimal. It was with Purely ironic, I'm actually holding a pen and I won't name names from a provider of mental health services whose own staff are in contact with services to say they cannot get access to their own crisis services for people who are contacting them in crisis. That is the state of our mental health system in this country. The government has left the severe mental health crisis unchecked before, during and after the pandemic. People are genuinely struggling and when they turn for help, it simply isn't there. Problems that can start small become crises as help is either not available or arise too late. So many parents are concerned with their children's mental health, but nearly a quarter of parents don't know where to turn for help when they face these problems. No one should be stuck in the awful position of waiting months on end for access to basic health services. That is why we need to see the plan in the motion enacted. It's why Liberal Democrats have consistently put money in the council's budget for dealing with mental health issues why we pledged to deliver more mental health hubs in York, and why the National Liberal Democrats put mental health on the same legal footing as physical health for the first time. Liberal Democrats are pushing for national action, creating walking centres for young people to provide early prevention and support. Pushing for a mental health practitioner in every school along the lines of the Be Well pilot currently being run in Greater Manchester. We do need to put an end to out-of-air placement by increasing capacity and coordination between mental health services so that no one is treated far from home. All of these are national measures, but there is a lot that we can do at a council level. And I'm sure that the Liberal Democrat group will engage fully on this issue. Thank you. Any other contributions? Councillor, Councillor uh, B. Burton. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, this is the time of the motion and I'll be fully supporting it. This motion rightfully states that mental health is just as important as physical health. The fact that suicide is the biggest cause of death in men under 50 is testament to this fact. However, as this motion also states, mental health services in the city are in crisis and chronically underfunded. Uh, my fiance, like many others, has seen her mental health deteriorate drastically since the first COVID lockdown. 
she's gone from one of the most outgoing people I know to someone who's crippled by depression and anxiety, and that's unfortunately led to several suicide attempts. When she's reached out to services for support in the city, we have found that there is almost nothing. Uh, in one situation, she was rescued from the river by police and taken to A&E. However, on discharge, she received no follow-up from mental health services. And worse than the absolute lack of service provision is the attitude of services that Council Seal Warshaw referenced. When reaching out for support while suicidal, my partner has been met with statements like, maybe you should, what do you expect me to do about that? And if you really wanted to, we can't do anything to stop you. Poor experiences for service users in York are consistent and long-standing, as is shown in recent Health Watch reports and the academic report, Death by a Thousand Cuts. Residents are being failed. To quote a paramedic in York, mental health calls are the worst to attend because they know that nothing is going to happen after they drop them at the hospital. These sentiments are echoed by police and charities that I've spoken to. Over a decade of Tory governments, of austerity from Tory governments has left our services in ruins. This excellent motion rightly calls for additional support, as well as several vital changes to mental health services. I just want to highlight one recommendation in particular, which is the mandatory safety plans on discharge. In the last year, I've seen my partner discharged from A&E while still suicidal, actively in psychosis, with no plan for how to get her home and who's being contacted about where she should go. Uh, and only last month, I was told of a patient who left Boss Park and walked directly into traffic, having to be rescued by a member of the public. The fact we had an excellent public speaker today telling similar stories speaks volumes of this situation, how common it is in the city. Much more needs to be done to safeguard people in mental health crises when they enter and exit services, and it's vital that this motion is supported to focus minds on tackling this problem. As Councillor Whitcroft states, this motion sadly won't fix everything. Just yesterday, we saw another budget announcements with no references to these issues despite their severity. But this motion does ask important questions, highlights the issue and makes a statement of intent by this council that things must change, and I would encourage everyone to support it. Thank you. I, I know there are one or two, two more hands. I think, Councillor Nichols, you wanted to speak. I suggest we make this the last one, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on towards the vote. Cool. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome this motion and the Conservatives will be supporting it. Um, my only disappointment was the councillors asked not to note any Conservatives' um, achievements. We have boosted mental health funding by £2.3 billion up to 2023 24 transforming the quality of mental health services and reducing pressure on A&E so we can cut waiting lists. Government has invested in, in innovative, innovative mental health support up space in GP service surgeries and helping to cut waiting lists and thousands of people continue to access innovative types of mental health support following the 3.6 billion pound investment in the National Academy of Social Prescribing. The government is also embracing innovation in treatment following funding announced at the spring budget the NHS is going to be the first healthcare system in the world to roll out clinical grade apps free at the point of use and pilot cutting edge pilot cutting edge digital therapies including digital digitising the NHS taking therapies for a programme. So hopefully you will agree that the government has given some support to mental health support. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Waycroft, do you want to uh, say anything to respond to this one before we go to the vote? Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Yes, uh, I would thank you for all who have taken part in this uh, debate. Uh, and I, I greatly appreciate all of the uh, input that we've had. Councillor Stills Warshaw uh, talking about the importance of monitoring, the, looking at the health watch support and the socio-economic underlying factors that often co contribute towards mental health issues such as homelessness and addiction. I'd also like to thank Councillors uh, Aaron Runciman for bringing their professional and personal experience uh, to this and for the uh, calls to the changes in the national government for agreeing to support this motion uh, on a bipartisan basis. I'd like to thank both Councillor Burton's, um, Councillor Jay Burton, uh, for referencing the public speakers uh, that gave forward their views. And I'm very pleased that the motion that I brought tonight was very well complemented by that of Councillor Rose earlier in the evening. Uh, and of course, uh, Councillor B. Burton for um, bringing forward his own personal experience. I, I wish him very well. He spoke exceptionally movingly. And I'm very pleased to hear his support for the mandatory safety plan. Uh, as well and for parity with physical health as this motion calls for. Councillor Nichols, I, I appreciate your point, uh, but I think I'm sure we'd all agree that we can always do more uh, and I hope that you'll agree this motion is a start on how we can build uh, to build better mental health and well-being in this city. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, with that, we will move to the vote.
So those who wish to vote in favor of the motion, please indicate by raising your hands now. That appears to be unanimous. Thank you very much. That motion is therefore carried. And we move on. And in doing so, I invite Councillor Vassi to move the fourth, our final motion this evening. This relates to analog telephone system withdrawal. Councillor Vassi. Thank you, Chair. As you will have seen, by the end of 2025, all phones will have been switched from copper wire to digital. That's nearly two years away. Plenty of time. Let's not worry about it. But the truth is, it's all happening now. Um, and 91% of people don't know it's happening. Over the summer, three months ago, in my household in Weldrake, we suddenly got a letter through the door. And we were told with just 40 hours notice that our phone was going to be switched from copper wire to digital. Didn't particularly bother us. We didn't really know what to do, but all you had to do was take your phone out of the wall, plug it in your home hub. What if you don't have a home hub? What if you don't have broadband? Two weeks ago, we had five power cuts in uh, about 36 hours. Um, we were able to deal with that because we also have mobile phones. Brilliant for us. What if you're living in a home that doesn't have a mobile phone and you have a power cup? What if you're 80 years old and your heating comes from electricity and you immediately start getting cold, but you can't tell anyone what's going on? A friend of my um, partner's uh, work colleague came into work tired last week. And my partner said, what was the problem? It was her next door neighbor had a power cut. A woman in her eighties had no way of contacting anyone. So she went to her neighbor and her neighbor was in. And the neighbor spent most of the night trying to get the electricity back on. What if you don't have a neighbor that you can call on? What if your family lives 30 or 40 miles away? I've got a, a resident in Weldrake who's like that with multiple health problems, can't get to the doctors because there are only five buses a day and it costs 35 quid to get from the doctors and back. This person relies entirely on her family to get to the doctors. What if she has a power cut? What if when her digital phone is unplugged and she has no broadband and no internet, I know she doesn't, What's she going to do to talk to anyone? How is she going to reach anybody? And we're not just talking about old people. We're also talking about vulnerable people in all sorts of different age ranges and categories. 20 seconds. Poorer people. What are we going to do to make sure that those people have health and access to the modern world that we're all stepping into fairly easily? How do we look after them? This motion simply says, we need to get scrutiny involved. We need to make sure we all know what's going on. We need to make sure that staff are trained and that we're properly working to help people. We've got to be independent service that helps thousands of people in York. That's great. I know that officers are working to make sure that the switchover works for them. What this is about are all those people who are simply not in the loop. I urge you all to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm pleased to second this motion. In recent years, we've seen a move from analog to digital technology, such as the move to digital TV services, which happens in 2012. That change was accompanied by a comprehensive publicity campaign, and the government set strict rules to ensure that a digital divide did not leave the most vulnerable behind. In contrast, the withdrawal of analog tele telephone services has attracted relatively little attention and is being driven by telecoms providers with apparently very little involvement by government or the regulator. I'm aware that Ofcom has published expectations for how telecoms companies should support customers during the migration, 
But there are concerns that in reality, some vulnerable customers are not getting the support they need to prepare for this change. Last year, BT paused the rollout of their digital voice home phone service, saying, and I quote, we underestimated the disruptive impact this up upgrade would have on some of, some of our customers. With hindsight, we went too early before many customers, particularly those who rely more heavily on landlines, understood why this change is necessary and what they needed to do. We also recognize we have more work to do on getting better backup solutions in place for when things disrupt the service like storms and power cuts. At least BT admitted they got things wrong, but it does highlight that this is not a risk-free change. Broadband is still not reliable. Just this weekend, the new ultra-fast optic broadband in Poppleton was unavailable from Thursday evening until Sunday evening, and then there are power cuts. Mobile phones are suggested as a backup method of communication in the event that a power cut puts your router out of action. That's all well and good if you've got a mobile phone and a signal. In some parts of York, such as Skelton in my ward, people are often seen doing that out in the street, trying to get a signal. It's very poor, and I would like to see this issue re re rectified as an integral part of the move to a digital-only phone network. This motion has been tabled to ensure that, as a council, we do what we can to make sure that all our residents get the support they need. 30 seconds. Not all elderly or vulnerable residents will have friends or family nearby who can help them navigate this change, which could have significant implications. <coughs> so I do believe that we have a responsibility to ensure that nobody is left behind. And the motion sets out some practical steps that could be taken. I would encourage members to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hook. And I'm looking to see if anyone wants to do that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I would like to welcome this motion from Councillor Vassy. Uh, you know, the digital switchover that is coming in 2025 or has arrived for some people already. Uh, potentially will have a major impact on hundreds of York residents, if not thousands. Uh, there will be many residents in York for whom it has barely any impact, but those who it does have an impact on, that impact could be huge. Um, and those most likely to be affected are the people in our city who are the most vulnerable. They are the people who um, haven't migrated to digital in their lives perhaps for choice, but perhaps for financial reasons, or perhaps because of uh, their own digital literacy and confidence in technology. Um, and I feel like as a councillor for Westfield, particularly uh, this, this motion is particularly relevant. I know that in our ward, we already have so many residents who struggle for many different reasons. We have many residents who are already incredibly isolated and this digital switchover has the potential to further isolate them. We have many residents who are already struggling to meet the costs of their day to day, you know, living. And if one of the ways that you do that is by not having broadband, then the requirement to have broadband, to have a version of a landline rather than a mobile is a massive issue. This also um, has massive potential knock on effects for uh, particularly vulnerable elderly people who rely on telecare systems that map into their phone lines. And I don't feel like enough work nationally has been done to really look at the impacts of that. Um, so I really applaud the work of, you know, 100% Digital York, who've been doing lots of work around digital literacy, digital skills and engagements, getting people technology, helping people access things like mobile phones and laptops. Um, but I 100% I support this motion because I think it's really important that the council actually... Uh, knows as we approach that 2025 as much as possible who those residents are who this is going to impact the most um, that we as a council and as councillors have done that kind of scrutiny around what options are going to be available for people um, and that we as a council are able to support people as best we can with the knowledge and information they need uh, to hopefully not be as badly impacted by the uh, 30 seconds this uh, switch over that's happening and on a personal note I have a grandma who is horrified by the thought of having to get uh, broadband 
lives in an area with no signal and barely knows how to she does have a mobile phone but you know doesn't use it very often and we have concerns as a family and she is supported we are you know she does have people around her and wonderful neighbors and all of these other things um I can only imagine what that is going to be like for people who don't have that support and uh thank family you around them. thank you thank you very much I oh, we're on another couple of fans Councillor Stewart and then Councillor Fenton Thank you, Lord Bay. I mean, just to absolutely agree with what, what's been said already, and I think it's a, a very sensible motion from Councillor Vassi, um, entirely well meant um, and entirely good outcome in what it's delivering. Um, it's not changing the world, but it does give some tangible things the council can do. Um, and I think with the whole digital world, you know, we're all aware of the issues of broadband, we're aware of the issues of people, you know, the final few, um, so residents in our ward who aren't on broadband, but equally there's people that can really seriously get left behind. And this motion highlights uh, an issue that I think is not on the table for a lot of people and I would absolutely class myself as one of the people who wasn't aware of all of, of this stuff and it really really does matter you know loneliness isolation is is, is one of the biggest problems <laughs> bar none um, so I welcome this motion in terms of what it says about this particular issue and the digitalizing of the phone network but also just I think it's a useful reminder about when lots and lots of people are going in one direction, we can't forget the people that are not going in that direction and leave them behind. And that's so relevant on the likes of the internet, the likes of phones and everything like that. So I will not say this every time, but I 100% support every aspect of this Lib Dem motion. And it's one that I think can go on leaflets and it can deservedly go on leaflets because <laughs> you've done something good, Lib Dems. <laughs> Councillor Fenton. Uh Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, just very briefly, um, if 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 Council is minded to support the motion, I'm I'm sure working with the chairs of the scrutiny committees, we can see how this this important item can be can be accommodated. Um, I know that scrutiny has talked about digital inclusion. The one thing we haven't uh, really addressed thus far is 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 digital is the digital infrastructure. Um, and it's important we don't overlook that because it is a key part of inclusion. The availability um, of the infrastructure is 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 part of um, what what is needed to, to to make sure people aren't left behind. Um, and hopefully, by getting some of the uh, telecoms providers around the table, we can better understand some of the things that they are doing. Councillor Hook mentioned um, BT, who who towards the end of last year admitted that they got things wrong. Um, I welcome that. It's I know many councillors will have found it difficult to track down a, um, a, a an internet provider who's dug up a street and then disappeared, and then another company appears who seem to have a different name and a different livery, and they say we knew nothing about that. Um, one of my concerns is that is the the fragmented nature of the system makes it very difficult for uh, even sort of tech savvy residents to know who to engage with, who to. Um, get support and information from. So I hope hopefully we can do a relatively um, quick piece of of work through scrutiny to make sure that uh, we do have some outcomes that residents and councillors can use in terms of their work with uh, potentially vulnerable residents. So um, I would hope members would support the motion. Thank you very much. I I can see this being another unanimous. Uh, well, I I know there are other hands, but I'm going to draw a line there. Councillor Vassi, do you want to respond before we go to the vote? Just very, very briefly, Chair, I just welcome the support that's been shown around and the clear demonstration that all of us as elected members uh, showed that, that we have a part to play. There are practical things we can do here that are not complicated, that involve us using our skills as a catalyst to bring partners together to ensure that vulnerable members of our communities are not left behind. Thank you for all the speeches that have been made. Thank you. So we move to the vote. Those who wish to vote in favour of this motion, please show by raising your hands now. Again, unanimous. That is unanimous, as I anticipated it. Probably was. Thank you very much. We, we come to the end of the section on motions and move to item nine namely questions to the leader or executive members. This is the point where I invite members to question the leader and executive members in respect of 
any matter within their portfolio responsibility. And this is in accordance with Council Procedure Rule B11. So please uh, initially uh, address your question uh, to me, but will you not only speak clearly, but indicate to which executive member you would want your question to be directed? In total, we have 15 minutes for this item. <laughs> Councillor Widdison. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Question is for Councillor Lomas. Um, at the executive, Councillor Lomas said that the funding for universal free school meals was on the medium term forecast table on page 101 of this agenda, of that agenda. Can you outline how over 5,000 primary school children will be given free school meals for the three years for the 300,000 when that equates to 10 pence a meal? Thank you, Councillor Widdison. Um, the funding in the um, table that Councillor Widdison quoted is the £100,000 per year required to continue to deliver free school meals at Westfield Primary School because we have committed that once the trial is over we will continue to fund those free school meals regardless of what else happens with our wider plans to deliver free school meals to all children um, at primary schools in York. I made that quite clear, it's pretty obvious I think. I'm happy to explain it again um, and I know that, that members of the opposition are struggling a little bit with the concept of finance and maths um, so always happy to answer questions on it. Councillor Wilson, was there a supplementary to that? Not a supplementary, but I don't struggle with maths. Ten pence per child across the city will not deliver free school meals for each of them. Any other supplementaries? Councillor Healy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, are you then saying that if you don't achieve enough money to roll this out across the city it will only be kept for one school in westfield as free lunches and one breakfast club in clifton what i'm saying councillor healy is what i said um which was we have committed to continuing to fund what we have begun to fund through council funding um, regardless of what happens with the other funding that we're seeking externally to roll this out across the city. I, I, I don't know how I can be clearer about it. Um, we've been really, really, really honest with people that free school meals for every child at primary school in York is not something that the council can pay for. Um, and that is that is absolutely the position we have taken um, since before our election that we would mobilize the city to provide free school meals for all primary school children that is exactly what we're doing um, and we can carry on answering these questions to you about it time and time again because you know frankly we really like talking about it because what we're doing is we're getting on with the job of delivering free school meals for all children but in doing that we are making sure that once we have provided free school meals as part of the pilot that you know that we're running in Westville Primary School because we've been really clear about that. Um, we wouldn't suddenly withdraw it. So that is what the council has committed to fund. Um, and separate to that, we are mobilizing the city as we said we would um, to provide free school meals for our primary school children. It's not difficult. Uh, further supplementary, this will be the last supplementary councillor. Very simple question. Can the executive member explain where on this leaflet the words mobilise the city are? Um, I, I admit that I cannot read that from here. Um, it, it's your Air. leaflet. Um, it's, so, it's your pledge. Sorry? If, if it helps, it's your pledge. Oh, I know, I know. Our pledge was to mobilise the city to no. provide free school uh, meals for primary school leaflet. children. Ensure we every can, primary school child gets a we, free we school can meal. Have this tip a tap. All day long, the councillor. Uh, it, it doesn't change what's actually happening. And what's actually happening is us delivering and our pledges. Councillor Rose. <laughs> um, 
there have been lots of articles about the local transport strategy and local transport plan and all residents and local groups know about the problems in the city and have ideas for improvements. Um, I think it's obvious which exec member I'm talking to about transport, um, but how and when do they provide input, please? Pete? How and when do people provide input into the local transport strategy and plan? <laughs> oh, thank you, um, Councillor, Councillor Rose. So, um, part of the press, uh, the local transport plan uh, consultation has been launched today. Hooray! So uh, it's up on the council website. Uh, it's featured in the York Press uh, today, uh, including a link to the interactive map that you can all uh, go on and indicate on that map where the difficulties are for you traveling around the city, where your pinch points are, what things are uh, would stop you from walking, cycling, getting the bus, or indeed being able to uh, to 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 drive around the city. So uh, that's that that's gone live. It is the uh, biggest consultation on transport and the uh, largest piece of work that we've had on transport since two thousand and ten. I think it's uh, we did hope to deliver it quicker, uh, but we have managed to deliver the uh, consultation within the first six months. So the, it's gone live today. I would urge you all. Uh, to make sure that your residents are aware of it, encourage them to to contribute to it, because what that plan is eventually will be formed uh, by the information and intelligence that, that we gather uh, from residents. The consultation closes on the 4th of February. Uh, there is 10 weeks, and everyone can think, oh, it's 10 weeks, that's all right. Okay, but don't forget, we're going through Christmas. Uh, so actually, you know, the sooner that people can start to input into that plan, uh, the better, especially given... The difficulties that we've experienced with transport in York um, this year, uh, dealing with a huge backlog of roadworks that we are we are cracking on with, um, and also of course you know we are a very popular city. People do like to come here from from all over the country and indeed uh, from all over the world, which is great. Uh, it's brilliant for um, for the economy side of my portfolio. If anyone's got any questions on that, uh, but it does of course cause problems uh, on our transport network and. Your residents will be acutely aware of those at the moment. So I think um, encourage them to participate. And finally, I would like to thank very much um, the contributions from all members. There's been a considerable amount of cross-party work has gone into formulating this transport plan. Lots of the policy ideas have come from uh, Liberal Democrat members, from uh, Conservative members. Uh, so thank you for that. I know there's been a few noises off within the parties of people trying to score political points with things that they've made up. I'm very pleased that the more sensible members of those parties chose to ignore that uh, and to continue uh, with by contributing to a constructive uh, programme that hopefully will start to tackle the really difficult issues that York faces uh, when it comes to transport. But as we have demonstrated, this administration is not afraid of getting to grips uh, with those difficult issues. Thank you. There were a lot of hands went up at once when I invited hands. Um, it's OK. Um, Councillor Healy, yours is one that I noticed first time round. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I feel honoured. Um, this question is for Councillor uh, Pavlovich. On the 24th of October... Sorry, Lord uh, Mayor, are you not taking the supplementaries first? Oh, sorry. Yours was a supplementary, was it? Yes. Uh, Councillor Merrick. put his hand up. Yes. Uh, the, uh, look, mayor, the newly elected mayor for York, North Yorkshire, once elected, will take on responsibilities for transport planning and certain other transport functions. Can I ask uh, for clarification on what responsibilities in the transport sphere they will be responsible for and how they sit alongside our own residual responsibilities as a council? Yes, thank, uh, thank you, Councillor Merritt. Uh, so <coughs> the the, the the most important part of this really is is deciding uh, what the key network is, uh, the key route network, and that is yet to be decided amongst the combined authority. Uh, so clearly there is additional funding that comes with the more as the key network is within the control of the mayor, uh, then the more funding that will attract nationally. But quid pro quo, I guess the less control as a local authority we have over those that that, that part of the network because they start to come under the mayor's uh, purview. Now, given that the mayor in all likelihood is going to be a Labour mayor, that doesn't cause us uh, too much concern. Uh, and I'm sure that any other party that has their mayor elected, that mayor will also behave 
sensibly and responsibly, uh, and that that mayor to to you know to that mayor will need to respond to the wishes of the city um, and the wishes of the city as expressed through the council and also through uh, our, our input to the combined authority. So I think there are powers that, that will transfer, but the extent of those powers will depend upon the definition of the key route network and that, that is to be is yet to be defined. Uh, our negotiations are, or discussions more, more so are going on with that. And as soon as we've got more information on that, we'll happily share it with all members. No more supplementaries? Okay, Councillor Ely. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, again to Councillor Pavlovich. Uh, on the 24th of October, Councillor Pavlovich issued a statement to the press saying that the Salvation Army could not legally be given a further extension. Uh, given we now know they were offered one, uh, could he give us an explanation for this divergence of fact? Thank you, Lord Mayor. That actually doesn't fall into my portfolio. That's Councillor Lomas. So can I direct that question to her? Certainly. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Um, and um, I think we've we've been very open and honest before that the decisions around the Salvation Army contract actually sat with myself and, and Councillor Douglas. Um, that's been the subject of much discussion, which you might have missed, um, but it has been made public in meetings. So I just want to um, go back to what has happened with the Salvation Army contract. So the contract was extended by way of waiver um, from the procurement regulations in um, February 2023. Um, and a six month extension was given at that point. Um, your, your administration um, made that decision. Um, what should have happened at that point was there should have been a process of re-procurement of the contract um, because waivers aren't a great way of, of um, going about things and that's why it's a, it, it's a waiver to the procurement rules that the council has for very good reason. Um, so what happened at that point was nobody did anything about re-procurement of the contract um, and what we were faced with um, when we took um, over the council was a contract that was coming to an end, which had already had a waiver. Um, and the advice we were given that was that another waiver would be inadvisable um, because there was, um, we'd already gone around the procurement rules. So what we decided was to um, have just a very short extension to allow um, a transition out of the contract. Um, so you're quite right, there was a further extension, a very short extension to the contract, because that was the right and proper thing to do um, to enable the transition out of the contract. The contract which um, should have been subject of re-procurement from February 2023, um, when the old Liberal Democrat administration made the decision to give the six-month extension by way of waiver. Um, I think what we have also been really, really clear about um, was that we have um, absolutely followed on from the work that the old Liberal Democrat administration did do um, in moving to a more comprehensive service for people um, who are homeless in the city, offering wraparound support, not just um, counting people and um, offering them uh, access to shelter for one night, but actually working alongside them, addressing the issues that have led them to that situation and supporting them into permanent accommodation. And I know that Councillor Pavlovic will be very, very happy to talk to you about the plans we have to build on that um, and to massively improve services for people who face homelessness in our city, but the um, decision around that particular contract was dealt with by myself and Councillor Douglas um, because we believe that procurement rules are important um, and we believe that we should be doing things in a fair, open and transparent way. Go ahead, Councillor Smalley. Um, Thank you, Lord Mayor. And it's good to, although Councillor de Gorn is no longer with us in the chamber, it's good to see through the length of answers that he's very much still has a presence. Um, 
I've got the um, email that was sent to Stephen Lewis at the press where, and I quote, the council's legal position was that the contract couldn't be extended again, therefore it had to end. I was at the scrutiny meeting where we were told that an extension was offered, in effect, another waiver. So can you just answer the question, which is why release that inaccurate statement? And then also just um, to add to that supplementary, Rachel Maskell, Labour MP for York Central, and was quoted by BBC News saying that she'd urged the council to reconsider its decision. Can I ask, as the relevant portfolio holder and the leader, um, what representations Rachel Maskell made to you, urging you to reconsider the decision? Thank you, Councillor Smalley. Um, as I said, I think in my comprehensive answer and detailed answer uh, to the first question, I think I've covered most of what you asked because um, you've asked <laughs> Um, about the short extension, which I explained, we made a very short additional extension to manage the transfer out of the contract. Um, that is what happened. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know how else I can say that to you. Perhaps that's why my answer was lengthy, um, because it is very common for members of the opposition <laughs> to twist everything that I say um, and present it differently. Um, so that's what I've said. I've given you the answer as to um, the representations made um, by the York Central MP. Um, the York Central MP has never spoken to me about this contract. Um, and um, I'm aware that, that, that statements have been made by all sorts of people publicly about this contract. Um, if anyone wants to ask me about it, I am more than happy, as always, to discuss it. Supplementary, Lord Mayor? We've had one supplementary, so yes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. This will be the final uh, um, part of this section. We've already gone over our 15 minutes. Thank you. Just, just a point of clarity. Um, you mentioned that the original contract was wavered and extended by six months in order to start the procurement contracts that didn't actually start. But isn't the reality that this was actually a much longer contract that ended in February 2023? And so the procurement process should surely have begun a good six months or more prior to the end of that lengthy contract rather than needing a six month extension from February 2023. Uh, thank you, Councillor Crosshaw. You're quite right. Um, lengthy contracts need planning towards the end of them um, so that we either re procure or um, make different decisions about how we deliver the services that that contract um, is there to deliver. Um, and it would have needed to be a minimum of six months prior to the end of the contract that that procurement process started. We can only surmise that that didn't happen and that's why the six month extension was needed. Um, and yet again, the procurement process didn't happen in the further six month extension, um, which was why we um, inherited um, a contract that had already um, gone over its um, length and had already been subject of a waiver. Thank you. Uh, that concludes um, questions and we move on. Uh, moving on to item 10, namely the report of the executive member and I'm inviting Councillor Kilbane, executive member of Economy and Transport, uh, to present his uh, report as set out in the council papers. I, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm now going to read all of my report, word for word, from beginning uh, to end. And as having been inspired by Councillor Smalley, uh, I'd forgotten about that tactic that you used to employ. I think uh, I think we might give it a go. Uh, no, I will. Um, I'll, I'll just be just be very brief. We we we've touched on. I I think you're right, Councillor. And I was just checking that with the Northern Robinson. I was just getting into my stride there as well. <laughs> that is a bit. That is the case. He doesn't. He doesn't. No, he doesn't, he doesn't get time to present. I'm very, very sorry, Councillor Colbain. You don't get to read your whole report, but you do get the opportunity to answer questions. Okay. Yes, um, Councillor Rowley. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Would the executive member for transport join with me in welcoming the additional £366,000 from central government to help with pothole repairs this year and another £366,000 for pothole repairs next year? Yeah, thanks. Um, th th thank you, um, Councillor Rowley. Uh, yes, uh, we welcome. 
uh, the investment uh, along the lines of, you know, when you're out at sea, any scrap of wood that's floating by, you'll you'll grab hold of, won't you? Um, our budget for this this current financial year uh, for those kind of repairs is is 8.5 million, which we will deliver, and we will deliver on time. And we did put a plea out to the government to say, look, you've got a, a trusted partner for delivery here. If you want to give us more money to to help us fix our roads, then you know, let's have it. We've shown you that we can deliver it. Um, unfortunately. Uh, I think the amount of money that they uh, gave us amounts to around about 3% uh, of the entire budget. Now, I did see uh, your erstwhile Member of Parliament for York Outer uh, did put a message out to all of the York Outer constituents saying, oh, we've got all this extra money, where would you like it spent? So uh, if your MP would like to tell me which 3% of the uh, road network they would like fixing with this additional money then you know we can see where it is on the priority list the, the 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 truth of the matter is to get our roads up to a reasonable standard following and at the risk of sounding like a stuck record 13 years of liberal democrat and conservative austerity to get them back to a state that would be acceptable to york residents will cost 190 million pounds and we have a revenue budget of 140 million. So the eight that we're spending this year, the 10 or so we'll be spending next year, really is just patching it up. You know, and that's that's the money that we've got. We spend it efficiently, you know, and all praise to the teams that that, that work uh, on doing on doing that work. We're spending it far more efficiently with a large patching than was done previously, because those repairs will stay for uh, you know, sort of 20 years. We won't get a lot of political benefit for it, of course, because you know, uh it's a 20 year sort of lot cycle that we're looking at rather than a two year fix to a pothole. Um, but, you know, we're doing what we can with the resources that we uh, get. And without wishing to sound too begrudging, Councillor Rowley, we do appreciate the money, but it's nowhere near enough. Councillor Rowley, you have a supplementary, yeah, I've got I think. A supplementary. Councillor Eyre also. Councillor Rowley first. Yeah. Um, so um, is the Executive Member of Transport confident that should a Labour government take control at some point next year, we will receive that £190 million pounds that you've alluded to? Well, I mean, I'm sure that all <laughs> local authorities throughout the whole of the land will be receiving their £190 million. Pounds. No, is the uh, short answer, uh, Councillor Rowley. Um, I, I suspect that going into the election, that the bike, uh, belts will be tightened uh, as we don't make false promises to um, to the electorate. So um, that's what we do. And then we do then You know, what you can what you can guarantee from. Uh, a Labour administration is that we do actually deliver uh, with what we've got, even though resources are tight, it doesn't stifle our ambition, you know, and we don't denigrate other people or laugh at them for trying to make the city a better place. That's right. Yeah, thank you for seeing that one, Councillor Kilbane. And I did note on page 131 that you made the comment, you more, we more than doubled road maintenance funding. I'm guessing you were in fact referring to the Liberal Democrats and Green administration. So simple yes or no. Will you commit to maintaining this level of spending and rule out cuts to the road maintenance budget? I think it would be uh, reckless of any uh, politician uh, to make future forecasts of how much money you're going to have and how much money uh, you're going to spend. Clearly, the you know main tip, well, trying to keep on top of the road network is very important to us, and it, it's a high priority as uh, as uh, as you've seen. But um, we don't sort of play fast and loose with the money like the previous administration because we know the trouble that that lands us in and the difficulties that we inherited from you that we are now facing and having to deal with the 10 million in-year deficit, the hole that we're trying to fill that you left us. And then, of course, the 10 million year-on-year -year budget cuts that we're going to have to make over the next three and a half years thanks to lack of uh, central funding uh, and lack of uh, uh, resilience in York, uh, given eight years of mismanagement by your administration. No other supplementary? Okay, we move on. When I invited uh, hands, almost every hand seemed to go up. Um, Councillor Fenton, and then Councillor Crawshaw. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, in relation to uh, Castle Gateway, which is mentioned in your report, uh, on, on which uh, a number of decisions have recently been, recently been made. Um, can the executive member tell us a bit about the engagement that occurred with with businesses in the run up to um, the making of that decision, and also why um, decisions have been taken in relation to 
car parking ahead of a wider review uh, of parking provision in the city centre. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And I think that's, um, you know, that, that is a very uh, fair question. I think following on from the uh, consultation that the previous administration undertook, uh, you can clearly see the hopes and the desires of the residents of York for a repurposing of Castle Car Park. So uh, we also, uh, the solution from the previous administration, of course, was to build a multi-storey car park uh, on St George's Field, uh, next to sandwich between the River Ouse and, and an ancient monument. Uh, when we looked at the sums for that, you know, it just, just didn't stack up at all. The, the business case for it was incredibly flawed. Um, and there has been admittance of that from uh, officers who've since left the uh, authority. So we had to scrap that, you know, and that is going to cost the city upwards to, of a million pounds because we're working in sort of round figures on that one. Um, more detail to follow. Uh, but we've had to scrap that. So the previous administration's uh, rather backward looking decision that was ill thought out and ill progressed is costing the people of York a million pounds. But to get back to the question, sorry, sorry, I was I was digressing. Yeah, yeah so we have, um, unbeknownst to us, uh, the York bid undertook a survey of parking uh, in the city. Uh, for some reason, it, it didn't really get shared much wider than um, some internal mechanisms, but I'm sure you were aware of it. Um, and it does show that throughout the city, we have capacity for car parking for all the cars that are currently coming. So the only time that actually Castle Car Park itself is full uh, is at 2 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. And at that time, this um, data shows us that was given to us by the bid uh, 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 in terms of how we're engaging with, um, with, with, with the business community. Uh, what it shows is that at the time at 2 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon when Castle Car Park is full, uh, there is spare capacity in both Piccadilly uh, and what they call the, the Shambles car park, which is the queue park down by the uh, by the BT exchange. Uh, and at those times, um, those car parks are shown as being sort of half empty. So I think the issue, and this is the conversations that we've been having with all of the businesses. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure you're aware uh, we've fully engaged with all the businesses. We've had them into West offices. They're really enjoying the new fresh approach and the energy and the vigor that, that, that we're bringing to it. And of course, there are difficult conversations to be had. Uh, and in those conversations, it always resolves with the fact is it's not about car parking. It's about footfall. You know, and so long as you're driving footfall to businesses, as all business people know, then you're going to increase the chances of those businesses being successful as long as they're right, offering the right things uh, in to, to, to the right markets. Uh, I'm, here comes Councillor Smalley. He's nearly, he's nearly missed my entire my entire speech. Um, so, you know, and, and businesses understand that. What we need to be able to do is make sure, and this is where the transport plan comes into it, we need to make sure that we've got the same or more numbers of people travelling to those areas, but without the harm that's caused by, uh, uh, by, by, by by too much traffic on the road. You know, you can see, you can see it, can't you, that, that where you've got car parks, they're like magnets. And so for Castle Car Park, it's like a magnet for cars coming down Fulford Road. Well, if you turn off one of those magnets, then it stops attracting so much steel. And businesses understand that. Obviously, they're concerned that they uh, might lose footfall. So the job will be to make sure that we keep that footfall going. Mm. Oh, apparently, you can't turn off a magnet. My my physics teacher colleague just told me. Thank you. Councillor, yeah, is this a supplementary? Yeah, on, I didn't really answer the question at all, despite the length of that. I'm oh, sorry, it's becoming, a, it's becoming a common thing. But given the two car parks you mentioned, Piccadilly, which you have committed to removing all non-essential traffic from accessing Piccadilly Car Park, and Q Park is not CYC, can you explain how the council will be better off closing a car park that generates £1.6 million in order to <laughs> save £1 million in borrowing? Uh, sorry, just, just for, for clarification. Uh, yeah. Uh, at what point um, did we say, I, I don't get your points about Piccadilly, you've made this point a few times about Piccadilly and I don't quite understand it. It's a city centre car park, the motion said, to remove all non-essential traffic. So how do you know centre. what's essential and what's non-essential? Well, you're not answering the question, but I can ask you a second supplementary, which is, do you think parking your car in the city centre is essential travel? If not, right. then... Piccadilly Car Park. What, what, what you... I recommend you do, Councillor Rare, because you are very interested in this subject because you, you raise it at just about every meeting that, that, that I'm at, is that you contribute 
to the uh, local uh, transport strategy and plan because it's through that process that we're going to be asking those questions. You know, who does need to drive into the city centre and who doesn't? And how do we get people who don't need to do so not doing it? That's entirely what the local transport strategy is about. That's entirely what we're asking uh, the people of York about uh, because we are not going to act in a high-handed way on this. We need that information and we need that input. And actually, there are going to be some tough decisions to make because, you know, some people... Uh, people get very attached to their cars, don't they? And they like they like to they like to. I mean, I, well, I personally do. I like driving my car around, but maybe that's because I don't do it very often. So it's a bit of a thrill when I do it. So it's kind of people do like their cars, you know. So some people will be very loath not to to make journeys in their cars, uh, and there'll be arguments around, you know, what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done. What we do know is we don't have the capacity. You know, just look at last um, last Friday Saturday, uh, where we were basically coming to, to, to gridlock in the city because we've just got too many vehicles in too, in too little a space. So that's why the transport strategy sets out to reduce the number of driven miles by 20%. That's going to be quite tough and not everybody's going to like it, but we need to answer exactly those kind of questions about removing non-essential traffic. Now, if I can take you back, Councillor, uh, uh, now that Councillor Small is back in the uh, back in the room, if if I can take you back, well, I think I think you've got your maths wrong on that, and I'll, I'll happily answer take take advice from Council Lomas. We'll answer that separately. Um, but if we can take you back to that motion, was council policy passed by this council at full council in 2019 mm -hmm. that your administration had four years to answer that question, did nothing about it while this city got worse and started to grind to a halt while you sat there and twiddled your thumbs. And now you sit there with all your narky little comments about what about this and what about that? And no, you're not going to be able to feed the children. And no, you're not going to be able to deal with the traffic. The people of York are fed up with that. And the fact that we're out there doing something, we're engaging and we're pre prepared to take those bold actions. We've been embraced by open arms, by the businesses, the civic institutions and the people of this city because they are delighted to see an administration that is prepared to actually do something. Councillor Kilbane, uh, due to your very short and pithy answers, we are now well over the 10 minutes allowed for this item. I'm, so I'm afraid, Councillor Crawshaw and anybody else who put up their, their hand, I'm afraid uh, we really have to move on. But thank you very much. Um, the next item, item 11, is report of the Chair of Corporate Services, Climate Change and Scrutiny Management Committee. So I invite Councillor Fenton as Chair of the Corporate Services Climate Change and Scrutiny Management Committee to move receipt of his report, again, as set out in Council Papers. Formally moved, Lord. Do I have a seconder? Oh, Thank you, Councillor Merritt. And does anybody wish to debate this? I didn't think so. Um, happy to vote it through by a show of hands. Thank you very much. I'm sure that's unanimous. <laughs> Item 12, recommendations of audit and governance committee. I invite Councillor uh, Jay Burton to move recommendations of audit and governance to council from its meeting held on the 8th of November of this year relating to changes in the council's constitution. Uh, this is as set out in the agenda for this meeting at item 12. Moving these recommendations, I understand there's a slight alteration to some wording in one of the annexes, um, and I'm going to invite the monitoring officer to just clarify that for us. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to move the recommendations of the Audit and Governance Committee, subject to three minor amendments, which the monitoring officer will now present. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. So, if I can direct members to the tracked versions, which I will be the only ones that, that I refer to, um, of the papers that you have in front of you, on page 154. There is a change of the wording that currently reads, if a group has... We'll, we'll now read if only one group has. Members have, I understand, had sight of this change already. Um, and it's just a change to ensure that the, the wording of the legislation is placed in, in the document. If I can then take members to page one. 
Can you repeat that? Yeah, phone me in the microphone, please. I'll, I'll move move it closer to myself. Will be page numbered one hundred and fifty four. We are changing the words if a group has to read if only one group has. So this is which line, which section? So it's the beginning of Annex 7 in section 2-1-C in the centre of that page. So and it, and it, will, it will now read if only one group has instead of if a group has. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the second change is on page 145. At paragraph 3.4. The word statutory will be deleted. That is. And then at pages 164, 175 and 176, the words him or her will be changed to them. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm sure we've all followed that. Um, we need a seconder. We have a seconder. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Webb. Um, do we want to debate this? Yeah. Councillor Vassi would like to debate it. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I want to raise some concerns about this. Uh, these 200 pages of proposed constitutional changes. If I understand correctly, these uh, changes are gonna be further reviewed by the constitutional working group. Um, I believe that. <laughs> Everyone could hear me, yeah. Um, I, will, I will move the microphone. Uh, Yes, what concerns me is this. Uh, there are changes proposed in here that uh, I think could harm the council going forward. I will highlight just one of them. Paragraph 811, 811 on page 219. This defines what is a routine procurement but it only refers to low commercial and legal risk. From my perspective, this is an ad inadequate uh, definition. Local government is about more than business. We're all aware of recent procurement decisions that have proved controversial and caused concern about vulnerable groups have generated media attention, et cetera, et cetera. The simple fact is, that local authorities have more to them than low risk and uh, low commercial and legal risk. We have democratic processes precisely to ensure that decisions work for residents, for elected members and for officers alike. We consider more than simply commercial benefit and legal risk. My concern is that we're we're being invited to agree to a number of things here that are not necessarily going to help all of us as elected members, as officers, and as a city. And I really hope that we are going to be looking at this and reviewing these details uh, going forwards. And I think I'm speaking on behalf of my whole, my whole group here, we are supporting this on the assumption that that is what's going to happen because otherwise I think we may live to regret some of this. Thank you, Chair. Does anybody else wish to speak to this? 
Councillor Crawshaw. Just a point of clarity, if I followed what Councillor Vassy said correctly, I, I believe the wording that is disputing is already in the constitution. So it, voting on the change below in that paragraph doesn't change the element around routine procurement and low commercial and legal risk. So the, the points that are made may well be able to be picked up by the review committee going forward. But it's not that that's new wording that's being inserted into the constitution, as, as if, if I'm reading it correctly. I'm, I'm going to give the monitoring officer the opportunity to come back in at this point. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Just briefly to confirm that if Council approves the, the amendments that are proposed this evening, that will be the end of the process for these and they will then, then be implemented with effect from first thing tomorrow morning. The remainder of the Constitution is what will be going to the Constitutional Working Group in chunks over the next uh, several months. Um, but as has been pointed out, the changes that you can see here uh, are aimed particularly in the uh, contract procedure rules at tightening processes rather than loosening them. So the aim is to ensure that we are more efficient with money than, than we presently can be. Councillor Lomas. I just think it's worth just clarifying that the changes are the things that are tracked changes. So therefore, where things have been struck out or underlined in the um, copy you've got in front of you, Councillor Vassy. Um, so routine procurement, that whole sentence up to clearly relate to um, is existing in the current constitution. It's not a proposed change. The proposed change is the striking out of the day-to-day -day operation of the council and replacing it with core administrative infrastructure or business functions of the council. Um, so that's the change. The routine procurement definition um, is not in itself a change. <laughs> Councillor Healy? Sorry. Just to say, um, our group is prepared to accept the Staffing Matters and Urgency Committee changes, the Officer Employment Procedure Rule changes, but we would like to see the Contract Procedure Rule changes added to the um, working group. Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm a bit confused here. The Chair of Audit and Governance is Councillor Hollier, who has approved these changes to come through to full council today. So I'm just wondering why you didn't participate or perhaps turn up to or A and G and give your viewpoint on the constitution at that point or speak to Councillor Hollier. It's on his recommendation that they're here now. So I'm, I'm just very confused. It's not an administration thing. It's Councillor Hollier and A and G that have brought these forward. Please do, Councillor Healy, briefly. I, I was actually substituting on A and G during that meeting. Um, we didn't pick up this point. It was picked up subsequently by Councillor Vassy. And given the new inclusive uh, arrangement that this Labour group is bringing, when you have new information, you then have a chance to change your mind. Um, Councillor Vassy brought up uh, an important point, and I don't think it's beyond the realms of um, this council to add that to the working group's um, remit. Okay. Given that we separate separate it out because there are there are three things that will be will go for and these are contentious. And if and you have also the latter amendment is not agreed, then we'll then we'll we'll look for alternative solutions. Members, uh, if I could have your attention, please. Uh, none of us want to spend hours on this, and we don't have hours to spend on it. We've got to deal with the, with the business in front of us fairly briefly. Clearly, there are areas here which are less difficult, fairly straightforward, and others where we may need to, 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 to look again. So can we break this down so that we can vote through what we can vote through? And if we find there are things which um, we get stuck on? Just, just a point of order, Lord Mayor. The, the process that the council operates is that the changes have been discussed, taken through ANG, the members of sure. the committee of 
taken the time to go through them all on our behalf. We haven't made a recommendation to us. These are supposed to be the minor changes to the, to the constitution, and I think there's more work to be done. If we start piling more and more work onto that working group, it's no danger that we end up grinding to a halt in it. And actually, the, the opportunity to, to these are working documents, right? That's the point of a constitution. It's a working document. I'm uh, okay. I'm being advised that we should go go through with the the vote on this as as it is. Um, clearly, there are some things that are causing concern, and they will have to um, surface again at an appropriate point. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I was concerned you wouldn't notice me then. Um, How could I fail to notice? Indeed, and, and it's worth saying there's been a lot of football on, so Councillor Hollier may have been distracted by that over the last sort of few weeks. Um, I, I think, yeah, although the intention is to bring sort of one side of, of things, or one, one, a number of areas to Council tonight, and then look at others with the Constitutional Working Group. As I would understand it, the Constitution can be changed at any point under any circumstances. Yep. Um, yeah. For me, the Constitution is, is is not a good document. It's not well worded. And I'll just, on two of the things that have been talked about tonight, the, the change as is, you know, further ratifies the position on political assistance that if you had 45 councillors in one group or even 46 councillors in one group and one councillor in another group, both groups have a political assistant. You know, that gives a clear basis. Well, I think it all, you can say two councillors in a group rather than one councillor. That's that's how it is, it is drafted now. And on the procurement rules, the procurement rules in some parts talk about the value plus VAT, and in some places don't mention VAT. So there's a lot of, you know, very basic stuff on drafting. But from my point of view, I think, but it, I think we should vote through what's here on the basis we can always change it, we can always improve it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so therefore we should be going for this to take it in the best direction because a lot of the stuff that's being changed is things like the job titles of employees, you know, head of paid service, etc. Um, if this was doing it and then we can't revisit it for four years or five years, I'd take a different view. But it does improve it on balance and therefore you know, I think we should go through with it. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Councillor Burton, you have a right to reply at this point. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be keen to do so. It's not when you went to the vote. And I think yeah, I think we'll do that. So, notwithstanding the uh, the concerns, uh, if you wish to vote for the motion, please raise your hands now. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to vote against because I think Councillor Lackin might be voting against. Those who wish to vote against? I hadn't noticed it might have been a hand. Or abstentions. One abstention. Thank you, Councillor Baskin. Thank you. We move on to the next item, item 13, appointment of independent member for audit and governance committee and an independent person for joint standards committee. And uh, it's Councillor Rowley who's going to, as chair of joint standards committee, move the recommendations and the report at item 13 of the council agenda, seeking to appoint an independent member of the audit and governance committee and an independent person for the Joint Standards Committee. Councillor Rowley, would you like to do that, please? Um, look, do I get three minutes, Lord Mayor? No. I, I, <laughs> I, I formally move, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Is there a, a seconder, please? No, we're stuck now. Oh, thank you, <laughs> Councillor Fisher. We have a seconder. Would anybody like to debate this? We move to the vote. You want to have a final word? I, I do, Lord Mayor, and, and really very simply that that whilst I support and and and, uh, and have proposed this, I would just like Council to know that no member or chair of either the audit or governance or the joint standards was involved in this process. And the first I knew as the chair of joint standards of these two really vital appointments was when the uh, agenda papers came out last week. Now, I have had a discussion with the head of governance about this. And I've had the assurance that it won't happen again. Thank you, Councillor Rowley. Can we just agree this? Please indicate if you wish to vote this through. Thank you. I think that's everybody. Thank you very much. Item 14, appointments and changes to membership. We're almost there. 
Do I have council agreement to approve the appointments and changes to membership set out at item 14 in the council agenda? Agenda, please indicate if you wish to do that. I'm sure that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. There being no urgent business for this meeting, that includes this meeting of full council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord.